Hello, dear misfits. We're almost at 25,000 subscribers. Let's hit that goal towards the end of September. Tonight we'll embark on a spine-tingling journey into the darkest corners of the unknown, creature encounters and true camping horror that will give you nightmares. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on those notifications, and brace yourself for the nightmares that await. And now... Story time. I had an encounter with a wendigo in the main woods while I was hunting. Edit to add full story, this happened when I was hunting several years ago. It was November of either 2015 or 2016. I went out hunting with my grandfather in a patch of woods not incredibly far from his house. I met him on the road by where we usually parked to go in. We loaded up, figured out a plan for where to post and what we'd do and set off into the woods. For those that like visualizing the best they can, this was a fairly dense section of woods bordered on two sides by roads. The hill I usually posted on, sat and waited for deer, was met by a large swamp on the bottom. I got to my spot and my grandfather went deeper into the woods. It had already snowed that month so the ground was covered with snow and more snow was due to fall that due but we figured we'd be out before it started. After being set up for a few hours the woods went dead silent. This usually only happens when a predator is around, I perked up and started looking around just to make sure I wasn't the target. I started hearing a crunching and squishing sound from down the hill from me. As I stood up and looked I saw a 7 to 8 foot tall emaciated creature ripping something apart and eating it. The creature and the ground around it were covered in blood which contrasted with fresh snow. At this point I audibly said what the f and it cocked its head and began to turn and look at me. Terrified I raised up my rifle and fired three rounds at the creature. It screamed the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life and dropped its meal and took off towards the swamp. I'm sure I hit it at least once but seemingly I only pissed it off. I immediately called my grandfather on his cell and before I could even say anything he said stay where you are I'm coming to you, we're leaving. Now. My grandfather was and still is an avid hunter and outdoorsman. He resembles a mountain man. Hearing that in his voice put me on an even higher alert because there was no risk of me misinterpreting what I had seen. He reached me pretty quickly and we hauled ass out of the woods. When we got to the vehicles we heard one last distant scream and that was it. He never acknowledged what we had both heard and I had seen and nowadays he just says he was cold and was tired of being out there that day. I have never seen anything even remotely close to that before or since. I know the story sounds crazy and if I hadn't been there I wouldn't believe it either. If anyone has any questions I'd be happy to answer it. I still hunt, I just make sure I'm out of the woods well before sundown now. Second edit, the Wendigo was roughly 7 to 8 feet tall. Emaciated with a distended belly, pale white skin that was both stretched tight and saggy. With long claw-like fingers and deep eye sockets with pure black eyes. One time, a few years ago, I had some free time in the fall, so I went to the woods for a couple days. I sleep under a tarp because I enjoy building the shelter, and I use the fallen leaves as a sleeping pad. One night, I heard some leaves rustling 30 or 40 feet away from camp. When I heard it, I figured it was a squirrel or something. But then it made a bee line for me. I heard much more defined steps and my heart drops. Whatever it is, it's coming closer and closer, and it's sprinting. I couldn't see a thing, but when it got maybe 10 feet from my shelter, it just runs off in the other direction. Scared the absolute shit out of me. Never felt such a primal fear like that before. Could it be a Bigfoot? Camping in the woods with my ex, she wakes me up around 3 am whispering that Teresa noise outside, something touching the van. I beeped the horn and a loud noise sounded like a bunch of feet running away. Managed to go back to sleep. Wake up around 7 to start breakfast and exit the tent to find a bunch of footprints around the tent and van, 
as well as what looked like claw marks on the trunk and side doors of the van. We left later that day instead of staying the last two days of our trip. It was the summer of 2015 and I was in 12th grade. Me and two other friends went on the camping trip in Alberta, Canada. The drive up was normal. We got to the campsite. And oh yeah, one of my friends who we will call Jeff brought his girlfriend who we will call Jane. So when we pulled up to our camp spot we unloaded our gear. Then had lunch. And then we went on for a hike. Around 3 o'clock we came back. Around 5.15. And for about 4 hours we sat around the campfire telling stupid stories and other stuff like that. But this is when S gets too real. We started to get the feeling we were being watched. Which is weird because there was no one around us for about a whole kilometer. So we thought it just might be a fellow camper. So I yelled out hey. But no response. So we just ignored it. Later that night I woke up to the sound of snapping twigs. I looked out of the tent curiously. And what I saw was a creature about 20 meters away from the tent. It was about 8 feet tall with nut brown hair. And that's all I could really see in the moonlight. So I woke up my friend. And he went pale. He slowly closed the tent zipper. And looked at me and said it's right outside. I told them that's impossible because it was just 20 meters away. I was staying with a girlfriend of mine while I was in college. She lived just north of Solomon's Island in Southern Maryland. On a small note, she lived at the top of a ravine in the middle of the woods. She didn't have neighbors for about half a mile in each direction. It was late on a Saturday at the beginning of the summer. I say late but it was really early, probably about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I couldn't sleep so I decided to go outside and sit on the deck reading and listening to music. It was really nice out so I figured why not. Her porch, patio was big and had an outside light that shined about 30 feet to the edge of the woods where it stopped and the night took over. As I sat and enjoyed my book and music I began to notice something. You know when you have your headphones on and you can still hear the external sound? Well, I kept hearing a rustling. It sounded like leaves rustling, but every time I hit pause and looked the sound went away. This went on for about 5 or 6 more times until I had enough. I knew I heard it, I wasn't crazy. So I paused the music. As soon as I did I heard the rustling. I shot up and looked at its origin. Still nothing in sight, but the sound remained. I expected to see a squirrel or a rabbit scurrying about but nothing. And the longer I listened I realized that it was not the only thing nearby. There were three. All moving in unison just beyond the light's reach. Again at first, I figured squirrels, rabbits, or maybe even a raccoon given the hour. But the next part is what changed my whole perspective. As I stood there staring into the abyss trying to find the origin of all the mild ruckus, an acorn flew past my head. At first, I thought oh it fell. Nope. They were being thrown from the darkness. My mind was racing. Oh my god, Bigfoot. That is all that I could think of. So I started picking up the acorns and throwing them back. Trying to escalate the situation you know, and hoping I can catch a glimpse. After about 5 minutes I grew tired of our game and wanted to test the boundaries. I started walking off the porch with a spare golf club in my hand from my girlfriend's brother's set and headed for the woods. Now most people who spend any amount of time in the woods will tell you that there's always sound in the woods. Nothing. Not a freaking sound. It truly was a deafening silence. No crickets, no breeze, no bugs. Zero, zip, nada. The only time this happens is when a predator is nearby. I'm an experienced hunter and I know everything that could be in those woods. Nothing would make it that quiet. A feeling of dread washed over me when all sound left. It was like those moments when time slowed down before an accident. But I pushed on because I'd come this far, no time to chicken out now. I started to move closer to the front of the house walking up the lane when I was altered to one of the wildest roars I've ever heard. 
Foxes will make a sound that resembles a woman's scream. This thing was otherworldly. It sounded like a mixture of a human scream coupled with a silverback gorilla roar. Nothing makes that sound. Every hair on my body stood up. I had never in my life heard something so grotesque and inhuman. The worst part was that it was about 30 yards away in the woods. I'm sure it was watching my every move. So, without turning my back to the woods, I slowly crept back to the house locking the door behind me. I tried to tell my girlfriend but she thought I was just high. It was real. It happened, I just don't know what it was. I've lived in East Tennessee for most of my life. Growing up I'd hear old wives tales and urban legends about strange creatures that roam the forest. For the longest time, I thought what every other kid thought, that they were stories told to scare kids away from dangerous places so they wouldn't fall into a ravine or get lost in the massive wilderness. I never thought any of it was more than made-up stories. That's not to say I didn't spend my share of time with covers pulled tightly over my head when the wind blew branches against my window that happened to face the woods. As I grew older I found myself gravitating toward the stories of strange creatures in the woods. That curiosity is what started me to investigate such things in my spare time. People around here seem to be obsessed with Bigfoot. As if he's some local celebrity. They tend to ignore or downplay other cryptids. I don't know why. With the hundreds of thousands of acres of unexplored and barely explored forest, it seems there's lots of space for anything that feels like making its home there could be left in relative peace. Me, I'm more of a fan of Dog Man, unofficially of course. You see, once I graduated high school, my only goal was to become a park ranger. Where else could you go to work and be surrounded by such glorious nature? even at its most dangerous. There are literally dozens of stories I could tell, but the one that sticks with me is the hikers from a couple of years ago. I remember it was early October. I always make the hike up to Klingerman's Dome several times during autumn. Gazing out over the canvas of trees spouting a myriad of colors, looking every bit like nature's fireworks show reinforced that I made the right career choice. I was on patrol when a call came in to go to the cabins near Fontana Lake. I got the address and headed south, crossing into North Carolina. When I got there I was met by a woman who said her husband, son, and brother-in-law had gone to the lake fishing and hadn't come back. I got the information I needed about their general description, names, and description of the truck and boat, then headed out to search for them. She said they were heading up to Wolf Creek. I called it in and told the station I would be driving down to Flat Branch to see if they went in the river there. It was a decent drive to get there but then it was a decent drive to get pretty much anywhere out in the backwoods of the Smoky Mountains. When I got there I found three trucks parked off to the side. Two of them had empty boat trailers. I checked the description the wife had given me and it matched one of the trucks. I had a beginning point for my search. I walked up to the water and looked both ways, hoping to luck out and find them coming in from a hard day's fishing. No such luck. There was a house nearby so I walked over and asked if they had seen my quarry. The man said he had been out fishing himself yesterday and recalled seeing a boat like the one I described with two men and a boy in it. I asked him which direction they were going and he said west. I asked if he had a boat and could take me up to Wolf Creek. The man's demeanor changed from friendly to deadly quiet. He agreed to take me across the river, but not all the way to Wolf Creek. I accepted what I could get. After a quick jog back to my truck to get my backpack, he ferried me across and quickly left. It was a mile or so to the rural campsite I suspected they had camped at. I started walking along the edge of the river, keeping an eye out for them. It wasn't long until I spotted a boat sitting on the shore. I approached the boat and it seemed to be the right one. Everything about this missing persons report seemed like just someone who stayed out later than planned. It was a little too easy. I would be very happy to find them sitting by a campfire about to pack up and go home. It didn't take long to hike to the campsite, but when I got there things stopped being easy. There were only two tents set up, 
but they both looked like someone or something had torn into them. I checked inside each one and found sleeping bags and general camp equipment strewn about. I did my best not to disturb anything. When I came to the second tent, I found something more disturbing. This tent was also in disarray, but as I looked I saw distinct drops of red. There was a notebook sitting near one of the sleeping bags. I picked it up and paged through it. October 3rd. We headed out for our annual fishing trip this morning. Mom wasn't too happy, but we told her we'd be back tomorrow. The drive to the boat launch was kinda long, but we filled the time talking about all the fish we were gonna catch and generally telling stories about the area. Dad tried to scare me with a story about a cryptid that lives in the area, but I knew he was just yanking my chain. We got to the boat launch and headed out into the water without too much of a hitch. Uncle Roger nearly fell in trying to get the boat undone. He didn't find it nearly as funny as Dad and I did. Once we were out on the lake and had our lines in the water, he seemed to settle in and enjoy himself. After a few beers, he was laughing about it with us. We caught a couple of fish but they were too small and we had to throw them back. Dad said he'd heard about a good spot up by Wolf Creek. We had better luck when we got there. Uncle Roger caught three largemouth bass and I caught two. Dad had a big one on his line, but it got loose before we could net it. It was starting to get dark, so Dad said we should go to one of the rural campsites. We pulled the boat up to shore and tied it to a large tree, then took our gear and hiked to the campsite. There wasn't anyone else there, which Dad said was odd, because the site is normally full. We unpacked and set up our tents, and Dad got a fire going while Uncle Roger cleaned the fish. We ate and laughed and talked until it was dark and we turned in for the evening. Dad said there was a better fishing spot further west and he wanted to go there early in the morning before we headed back to the cabin. It's the middle of the night and Dad is playing a joke on me. I woke up for some reason and he wasn't in the tent. I could hear rustling outside along with something pawing the ground and snorting. I knew it was dad trying to scare me. He and Uncle Roger had been telling cryptid stories while we ate supper. I told them they weren't gonna scare me like they did last year. They just looked at each other and smiled. I knew they would have something up their sleeves. I didn't bother to turn the light on or go out and check. I knew they would just run away and hide, pretending to be a creature I had scared off. Then in the morning, they would ask each other if they heard the commotion hoping to scare me. I wasn't falling for it. One thing you learn from having a prankster for a dad is not to believe anything you see, or in this case, hear. I rolled over and tried to go back to sleep, but dad was making it tough. He was stomping and growling around so loud trying to get my attention, but I wasn't having it. When I got up in the morning and went outside, the camp had been destroyed. Uncle Roger asked if I had heard anything last night and I played along saying I'd heard some creature outside our tent but I was too scared to go out and check. He made a good show of searching for dad and seeming genuinely concerned. I was just waiting for dad to get tired of the game and come back to the campsite. As the morning wore on, Uncle Roger started talking about going to look for him. I wanted to tell him I hadn't fallen for their little prank but didn't want to spoil their fun. When noon rolled around and dad wasn't back, I started to get worried. Maybe he had fallen and hit his head on a rock or something. Uncle Roger was beside himself. He told me he would have already gone looking for dad, but didn't want to leave me alone at the camp. We decided to go look for him. Uncle Roger found what looked like a scuffle and we headed off in that direction. He told me to stay right with him as we struggled through the forest looking for any sign of dad. I was starting to doubt that this was a prank. I was getting worried about dad. The further we went the more I realized how wrong I'd been. I wanted dad to jump out and scare me just so I'd know he was okay. We walked around for hours, searching for him, but we couldn't find him. I was beyond worried now and I could tell Uncle Roger was too, but he didn't let on. He just kept saying dad was probably already back at the campsite now. When the sun started sinking low in the sky, we gave up our search and headed back. Twice, we lost our way and had to double back to get to the site. There weren't many trails out here, 
At least not that people had made. When we got back to the site, I ran to our tent, hoping he would be there, but he wasn't. We ate a quick supper and turned in for the night. Uncle Roger promised me he would wake me up when dad came back. October 4th. Uncle Roger never woke me. Dad didn't come back. I said we should call for help but he told me dad had the only phone. We were trying to decide what to do when we heard a rustling in the woods and the birds went silent. We looked around for the source of the noise, and unfortunately, we found it. There was a thing coming toward us. It stood on its back hind legs and its body made these loud cracking sounds like its bones were snapping into or out of place echoing all around us. This thing was huge. I literally froze. My body refused to move as this horror came toward us. Uncle Roger grabbed me and yanked me over behind his tent. We tried to hide, but this thing saw us and let out a massive roar. We were so close I could see blood on its claws and teeth. I prayed it wasn't dad's. WH. What do we do? I said. He put his finger up to his lips. It looked over at us and then went into my tent like it was searching for something. Come on, Uncle Roger said. We snuck away from the monster as quietly as possible. We slipped down the bank of the creek and walked downstream in the water. Where are we going? I whispered. There's a bridge downstream. If we're quiet enough and that thing loses our scent, we could hide under it and hope it goes away. I focused on walking as quietly as I could through the water. The sound of the creek was loud, so I was hopeful it wouldn't see or hear us. It seemed like forever until we reached the bridge. It was a small, wooden bridge that spanned the creek allowing hikers to pass over. There wasn't a lot of cover. We tried to wedge ourselves into the shadows at the furthest end of it. Time slowed to a standstill as I sat there on the uncomfortable rocks, shivering. Neither of us had our jackets on, and the sun had gone down, taking the warm air with it. I started to doze when I felt a nudge. I looked up and Uncle Roger was motioning me to be quiet. I was about to ask why when I heard the creak of a board on the bridge right above my head. It wasn't a steady walk of a hiker going down the trail, it was a slow, deliberate step on someone sneaking. Or hunting. I listened in mortal terror as the board slowly gave way to the weight of whatever was on it. One. Slow. Step. At a time. As if I wasn't cold enough. My teeth began to chatter with fear. It couldn't have been very loud. Uncle Roger barely heard it and went into silent convulsions motioning me to stop. I bit my tongue to keep the noise down and continued to listen. Only there was nothing to listen to. Whatever was on the bridge had stopped moving. It was as if it was listening to be sure it had heard something. I strained my ears to listen for any movement. When I did, I heard sniffing. The thing was trying to catch our scent. For the first time, I noticed there was a slight breeze blowing. It was blowing in the same direction the water flowed, but I had no idea which side of the bridge the creature was on. The wind could be our savior or our doom. Another slow footstep sounded like a bomb going off as the board creaked beneath it. For the briefest of moments, it seemed like it was moving away toward the far end of the bridge. I hoped and prayed that was the case as another footstep sounded, then another. I breathed a silent sigh of relief as I heard it step off the edge of the bridge and onto the trail. My relief was short-lived though as I saw a face peek around the corner and peer under the bridge. I froze in terror as this thing that looked like a giant monstrous dog walking on its hind legs, snuck around the corner of the bridge and dipped its feet into the water. It sniffed the air and poked its snout into the shadows under the far side of the bridge. Coming up empty, it turned its focus to the side of the bridge where we were hiding. Daylight had faded to dusk. There was precious little light to see by. That was our only saving grace, the shadows were darker here, making us nearly invisible. But that was rapidly ending as the beast approached. My mind was vapor locked. I had no clue what to do. Running would just give us away more quickly. It was looking like our only choice was to die. At that moment I was 100% sure of what had happened to dad. Hot tears streamed down my cheeks at the thought of my father being torn apart by this monster. 
As I prepared to die, I felt Uncle Roger lean over a little closer. He was right in front of me and it was hard to see the monster. I saw his hand move down toward the ground and pick up a stone the size of his fist. I knew right away what was happening. He was trying to shield me. He would offer himself as a sacrifice to protect me. My tears redoubled making it hard to see. The monster was almost on us. It hadn't acted like it knew we were there, but at this point, it didn't matter. A few more steps and all doubt would be removed. I saw it reach out with its terrible claws that nearly touched Uncle Roger's nose. This was it. Suddenly it stopped. It lifted its head and sniffed the air. I saw the hair on its back, bristle, then in a heartbeat, it disappeared. Uncle Roger slowly stood and looked around. I tried to do the same, but my legs didn't want to cooperate. I dislodged some stones as I stood, making a little noise and causing Uncle Roger to hiss at me. We stood silently waiting for that thing to come jumping out at us from whatever hiding place it was in. After a few minutes, I began to hope that we were okay. Uncle Roger led the way back to our camp. He said we should change into dry clothes and get a little rest. It felt so good to be warm again. I snuggled up in my sleeping bag and wrote this message so that if we don't make it, someone would know what happened. I hope my dad was as lucky as we were. I read through the entire message, then went back and reread the description of the creature. If it was what I thought it was, it was amazing they were still alive. Knowing what I was tracking put me on guard and made me wonder if I was being hunted right now. If it had intentionally left things lay so it could ensnare another victim. I didn't have much hope of finding them, but I would look anyway. I started with the tracks in the camp, specifically the ones around the tents. It seemed like the boy and his uncle had gone towards the creek. The creature's tracks went that way too. It followed them to the creek where its tracks seemed to wander around as if it had lost its prey. I saw where they went into the water to throw off its scent. Smart move. I followed the meandering tracks until they came to a small bridge that forded the creek. The tracks went over the bridge, then through the creek underneath it. That didn't make sense unless they were hiding in the shadows. The creature's tracks made a sudden turn and went toward the trail then up a hill, almost like something spooked it. If it was what I thought, I couldn't imagine anything spooking it. I followed the creature tracks up over the hill, then they doubled back and followed the creek from the top of the ridge. I noticed there was a good view of the creek. It didn't make sense to be going this way until I found myself back in the camp. It had put them right back in its sights. I was confused for a while. I couldn't find a second set of tracks where they left the second time. If the creature had slaughtered them at the campsite there would be a lot more blood, but there wasn't. In fact, I couldn't find any proof they'd come back. Then it hit me. I went back and looked at the tracks again. There were a few here and there that were doubled. The boy and his uncle must have come back here after the bridge, then left again the same way as before. The disturbing thing was I still hadn't seen any tracks of the father. I circled around the camp slowly looking for anything I might have missed. Eventually, I found a set of adult tracks leaving a tent and going to the edge of the trees. They stopped facing a tree. There was a dark spot on the bark a couple of feet up. This had the earmarks of a late night bathroom break. But the confusing thing was the tracks never returned. Like he had stopped there to relieve himself and then just disappeared. I searched all around the tree when I made a startling discovery. There were flecks of blood farther up on the bark. I circled out further from the tree and found my terrible discovery. Tracks of the creature with drops of blood beside it. My marrow turned to ice at the implication. I followed my new trail hoping I wouldn't find what my mind was telling me I would. I tried to report to the station on my radio, but strangely all I got in response was static. I knew there were areas out here that didn't get good reception. But I didn't think this was one of them, right near a posted campsite, just off a trail. I decided I would try again later. I adjusted my backpack and started off after my prey. As a precaution, I pulled out my sidearm and made sure it was loaded. It seemed like a silly thing to do, but when dealing with a dangerous alpha predator, 
It's best to make sure you're ready to shoot. My hand shook a little when I put my gun back in its holster. I knew this was dangerous. I knew it would be just as easy to go back to the station and let search and rescue take care of it. But I also knew that there was a man who was in the clutches of a deadly creature and he was losing blood. I didn't have time to waste. I followed the tracks as best I could through the brush and fallen trees. I would lose the trail sometimes only to pick it up again when I found a few more drops of blood. The tracks ran along the base of the hill heading west until it came to a stop. It was right in front of a mountain. I looked all around but the trail had disappeared. Finally, in desperation, I looked up and noticed a cave partway up the mountain. I thought about going up there but was unsure. That could be the home of this creature, or it could be the home of a dozen other animals, none of which would appreciate me storming into their living room unannounced. After another thorough look around the area, I decided it was likely where my prey had gone. Clouds had been rolling in all day and now decided they were done playing nice. The rain began slowly enough but was soon coming down in sheets. The cave was looking better as I covered my eyes and tried to see where I was going. It was raining so hard I couldn't see the cave anymore. I just kept pressing forward in what I hoped was a straight line, over fallen trees, through brush and rapidly rising streams. I finally looked up and saw I was at the base of the mountain. My direction was off by a little bit and I had ended up a few dozen yards to the right of it, but it was no matter. I started climbing the mountain, being extra careful of my footing, especially in this torrential downpour. After a few slips, including one that had me nearly tumbling off the mountain, I made it to the mouth of the cave. I slipped inside and enjoyed a moment without water dumping on me. I looked down and the water dripping off of me made a little puddle like I had brought my own rain cloud into the cave with me. I shook off as much water as I could as quietly as possible. The rain pouring down outside made loud splashes inside the cave. It would have been difficult to hear anything else, but I still wanted to be sure. I unbuckled and sat the backpack down just inside the mouth of the cave. The rain had made it gain extra weight and I didn't know if I would have to move fast. I opened my pack and got out my bottle of water and drank. It had been a while since I had drank anything and I chugged half of it down. I closed it and saved the other half for if I got out of here alive. With that happy thought rattling around in my brain, I stowed the water bottle back in my pack and pulled out a small flashlight. I turned it on while pointing it at the floor. The bright beam illuminated the cave. It was large as caves go. I could stand up in it and not reach the ceiling. There were many boulders and stones, it wasn't a smooth floor. The walls were rough, there weren't any cave drawings in here. I walked slowly, each step felt like I was closer to my doom. I pulled out my gun and held it tightly, the sense of foreboding thick in the air. Two thoughts impressed themselves on me. Firing a gun in here would probably deafen me. And the stench was horrific. It smelled like an open sewer in the middle of August. As I crept deeper into the cave, the sounds of the rain diminished, replaced by an eerie silence. I could hear the step of my feet, my breathing, and my heart pounding. As I was seriously considering turning around and leaving, when I saw something ahead of me move. It was big. At least as big as me. I dove against the wall for some cover, forgetting that I was holding a bright light in my hand so it didn't matter if I tried to hide as long as the light was on. I pointed it at the floor but didn't turn it off. I heard a shuffling sound getting closer. I was tempted to turn off the light but giving the edge to this creature was not a good idea. It already had the home field advantage. I heard it sniffing, but I couldn't see it yet. I decided to find out more by bringing my light up and shining it deeper into the cave. I got the shock of my life when my light landed on the creature and it was only a few steps away. It was big, at least six feet tall, and looked like a dog, with a long snout, only its body seemed elongated. It stood on its hind legs and had hands attached to muscular arms. Over all it looked like a nightmare. Part 2 it recoiled from the light and let out a growl. It was all I could do to keep from soiling myself. Without thinking I pointed my gun and fired. 
The sound was deafening. My ears instantly started ringing. The creature roared at me then turned and ran deeper into the cave. It had roared a mere few feet from me, yet I barely heard it. I stumbled and had to take a minute to steady myself. Then I started following it deeper into the cave. To this day I really don't know why other than needing to know if the hiker was alive. I looked at the ground to see if there was any blood but there wasn't. I must have just startled it with a shot. That wasn't great news. I'd hoped I would have hit it and it was wounded. Just scared meant it would be ready to fight when I saw it again. After all, I'm sure to the creature I was the invader and it was defending its home. I continued farther into the cave, shining my light and watching for any sudden movement. I had no idea where it was or if it was setting a trap for me. I felt a whiff of air and jumped back a split second before the claws sliced the air where my face would have been. I rolled and came up shooting, holding my light beside the gun to illuminate my target. I fired over and over, pointing and shooting without having the time to aim. I watched as it ducked every shot and ran with inhuman speed. Just before it disappeared from sight, I saw it skip a step as I fired my last shot. My hopes soared that I had hit it at least once. I ejected the magazine and put a fresh one in, reminding myself that I only had one more and chastising myself for not being more careful with my limited ammo. I justified it by telling myself there's no use dying with a full magazine. I followed once again, nearly jumping for joy when I came to the spot where it had disappeared and saw a spot of fresh blood on the ground. I was hoping for more, but as I went, the drops were every few feet. Even though it didn't seem like much, at the speed it was running I was sure it had sprung a major leak. I followed the trail deeper into the cave. There was a chill in the air that made me shudder. My mind told me it felt like a tomb. My tomb. I shook off those thoughts and continued until the blood stopped. I shone my light on the small puddle and the ground beyond where there was no blood. My mind screamed at me that it was a trap. I shone my light all around, even on the ceiling, but I couldn't see it. I started backing out the same way I'd come in, my eyes darting all around in search of my prey. It hit me like a bulldozer going 60 miles an hour. It had come out of nowhere and rammed me in the back. I sprawled out on the floor, rolling to a stop. My flashlight lay a few feet away and I had no idea where the gun was. The wind was knocked out of me. I tried to breathe but couldn't. I just lay there gasping for air. It slowly circled around me, growling and bristling. I knew it was going for the kill. I screamed at my brain to move but my body refused to cooperate. I tried to focus on my breathing and regain mobility as it circled closer. I could see its breath chugging out of its mouth like a steam engine. I knew it was time. My arm was the first to recover. I slowly moved it toward the flashlight. It stopped circling just as I got a grip on the light. I saw the creature hunching to lunge at me. I clicked the light to strobe and aimed it at the creature's face. It screamed and clawed at the air as if it could fight off the light. I rose to my knees, keeping the light on it. When it turned away, I shone it around desperately searching for my gun. I found it a few yards away and tried to run for it, but my body hadn't fully recovered and I fell flat on my face. My life in the balance, I didn't bother with the pain of my freshly broken nose, I crawled toward the gun with every ounce of energy in me. It seemed like an eternity until I put my hand on the grip and brought it to bear on the creature. It had recovered and was running at me full speed. I shone the strobe at it again and it veered away from the light. I stood and aimed at it, squeezing the trigger. I saw the satisfying impact of the bullet in its side and squeezed the trigger again making another hole on the far side of its chest. I squeezed over and over, hitting it each time and watching it reel from the impact, but it stayed on its feet. It growled and charged as my slide locked back showing an empty chamber. I shone the strobe in its eyes once more but this time it just ran off to the other side of the room. I used the distraction to eject my magazine and load in the last full one. I released the slide and started firing immediately, hitting it in the hind quarter and leg, but not stopping it. I stopped shooting and forced myself to concentrate. 
I aimed carefully as it ran toward me and at the right moment I squeezed the trigger. It went down hard, squealing like a stuck pig. It thrashed and clawed at its face, tumbling over itself. Blood flew everywhere from its many gunshot wounds, but it still continued flailing about and squealing in pain. After a few minutes of this, it finally settled down and was still enough for me to see my handiwork. I had shot it in the eye. There was nothing left there but a bloody hole. I didn't dare approach it. I stood at a respectful distance and watched, my gun ready if it tried to make a move. Its squeals became moans, finally turning into a heavy sigh and then it was still. I shone the light on it, feeling cautiously optimistic that this thing was no longer a threat. And then I remembered what I was doing here in the first place. I tried to get my bearings and proceeded further into the cave. My main thought was not only finding the hiker alive but also hoping and praying there wasn't another one of those creatures here. I didn't have another fight like that in me. The path curved downwards until it came to a large open area. I shone the light around looking for anything. Off in the far corner, there was a flash of red as I panned through. I approached it cautiously and found it was a jacket. Inside the jacket was a piece of meat that used to be a human being. His throat had been ripped out and his legs were gone. All that was left of them were some bones. The thing must have been working its way up, saving the arms and torso for later. The man's face was a frozen scream. I can't even imagine the horror of being dragged away from your loved ones only to be murdered and eaten in some cold, dark cave. I wasn't even sure if he was dead when the thing ripped his legs off. I had to stop focusing on such things and decide what to do. If I left the remains here there was no doubt some other animal would come by and finish off what the creature had started. I needed to try to get him to his family for closure and a proper burial. I bent down, trying to figure out how to carry him. A fireman's carry was out. There were no legs for counterbalance. In the end, I picked him up by his arms and flung them over my shoulder, holding onto them and turning his body into some macabre backpack. I started back out of the cave, hoping I'd be able to carry him all the way back to the campsite and finally back to my truck. As I trudged back through the cave, I came to the section where our fight had taken place. Shell casings and blood were strewn about the ground. I wondered to myself how I had avoided getting hit by a stray ricochet when I looked over to where the creature lay. Only it wasn't there. I shone my light all around frantically whipping around, but it was gone. I found the spot where it had laid still and I thought it had died. There was a large pool of blood there, but no body. I pulled my gun out of my holster, ejected the magazine, and checked to see how many rounds I had left. There were only two. I hoped wherever that thing was that it was no longer in the mood for hunting. Or revenge. In the end, I decided there was nothing I could do. If the thing attacked me, I was defenseless carrying literal dead weight on my back. I holstered the gun and hitched up my human backpack, then shone the light toward the mouth of the cave and kept walking. My hearing was just starting to return to normal, although I was sure I would have some permanent hearing loss. I could hear the shuffling of my feet as I staggered toward the cave opening. When I got there I found a world transformed. Daylight was just starting to peek its way around the dark. However, the rain had created a massive fog bank. I couldn't see anything down in the valley I'd come from. It was a sea of fog. Only the peaks of the mountains escaped its suffocating blanket. I looked over and saw my backpack patiently waiting for my return. I lay my burden down and got the water bottle out, glad that I had saved the last drink for now. As I sat on the edge of the cave precipice, I looked down and wondered how I was going to get the body down there without falling to my own death. For an instant, it was tempting to throw it down and find it at the bottom once I climbed down. But I thought this fellow had been through enough and didn't need the indignity of becoming a human frisbee. I dug through my backpack and found some bungee cords. I bungeed him to my back and carefully started my descent, leaving my faithful backpack to watch me desert it. I wished I could take it with me but there was no way I could carry both. As I climbed down there were a few times I lost footing and nearly took the short and deadly route down. 
Fortunately, I made it to the bottom in one piece. Instead of celebrating though, I discovered a new problem. The fog was so thick I could barely see my hand in front of my face. I had no idea how I was going to find my way out of there. I decided to go straight away from the mountain and hope the fog cleared as I went. The rain had turned the forest into a marshland. The ground was soft and the streams had overgrown their banks. I found myself wading through knee-deep water on more than one occasion. As I trudged along, hoping I had enough energy to get back without collapsing from exhaustion, two thoughts chased each other around my mind. Where were the other hikers, and where was the creature? I hadn't seen any other remains in the cave. If it had killed them, it hadn't had time to take them back to the cave yet. Perhaps my pursuit had forced it to retreat to its cave before it could properly retrieve its other bounty. I had kept my ears open for any sounds of it following me. The most disconcerting thing was the lack of forest noises. The animals and birds were strangely silent. Usually, that meant there was a predator nearby. In this ungodly fog perhaps they were just sleeping waiting for it to clear. That sounded good. It gave me the false illusion that I wasn't in mortal danger from a wounded alpha predator bent on revenge. But I couldn't focus on that or worry would drain my resolve to get us both out of there. I took a break from trudging and tried to get my bearings. I checked my watch and I had been walking for over an hour. It was late morning and the sun should have been high in the sky. But the oppressive fog continued to smother it. I looked around, but there was nothing to see except the dingy grey curtain of hopelessness. I was about to collapse and give up when I heard it. The faint sound of hope. I could hear the creek running. As hope rose, it was suddenly dashed. I heard the sound of a footstep behind me. I whipped around so fast that my macabre backpack nearly made me lose my balance. I couldn't see anything through the fog. But that didn't mean it wasn't there. With a renewed surge of determination, along with a strong desire to elude whatever was pursuing me, I set out toward the sound of the creek. It was still slow going, but I found fearing for my life was a great motivator. I had no doubt whatsoever that the footsteps behind me were those of the creature bent on revenge. After what seemed like an eternity I gazed at the most awesome sight I'd seen all day, Wolf Creek in all its six foot wide, overflowing banks glory. I followed it until I came across Lakeshore Trail and the journey became much easier. The fog was even beginning to lift, which was a blessing but also a curse. I could finally see far enough behind me to confirm that the creature was indeed following me. I'd wondered the entire time why it hadn't overtaken me, but now that I caught sight of it, I understood. It was grotesque. It looked like it came straight from hell. Its one eye socket was leaking gore and the many bullet wounds covered it in blood. There were places where I could see internal organs trying to escape the body and its right leg had a bullet wound. It limped severely. As I watched it I wondered how it had made it this far. But then I looked into its remaining eye and saw intense rage burning. I knew I would die a horribly grotesque death if I slowed enough for it to catch up. We continued this slow OJ pursuit of death until I reached the banks where Wolf Creek opened up into the lake. My energy was nearly gone. At one point I considered dropping my human backpack in hopes that it would feed on it instead of me. But then I would have failed. I came here to find this hiker and bring him back. The thought lit a fire deep within me. I came to the edge of the lake, with the creature a mere few yards behind me. I glanced around, hoping to see a boat I could flag down, but no such luck. With no other choice, I waded into the water. It was cold but instead of refreshing me, it chilled me and sapped my little remaining strength. The creature entered the water behind me and seemed to be gaining. It got deeper to the point where I was no longer able to walk and had to start swimming. The far side of the lake looked like it was miles away, even though I knew it was much less than that. I swam for all I was worth, knowing at any moment I would be pulled under by the creature. My passenger strapped to my back wasn't helping either. The literal definition of dead weight every minute I had to fight off the urge to dump him. When I reached the other side I was exhausted. I lay there on the shore, waiting for the creature to disembowel me, 
but unable to move to defend myself in any way. With great effort, I turned to look back and see when my doom would come. To my great surprise, I saw it staring at me from the far beach. I guess it couldn't swim. I chuckled to myself as I lay there gathering strength for the continued journey back to the truck. Eventually, I got there. As I opened the door, for a fleeting moment I considered putting the hiker in the passenger's seat. But then I looked at the wet, gore-soaked torso and reconsidered, gently laying him in the truck bed. The drive back was long and I continually had to shake myself to stay awake. But eventually, I made it to the cabin. I stumbled up to the door and knocked once. Oh my god. The woman said when she saw me. Are you alright? I hung my head. No, but I will be after around three days of sleep. Unfortunately, I have bad news for you. I found your husband, but not your son or brother-in-law. A man and a boy came out of the cabin and stared at me. I instantly knew who they were and grabbed them both in a huge hug. I'm so glad you made it out, I said fighting back tears. Um. Thanks, the man said pulling out of my hug. Who are you again? He's the ranger that came to look for all three of you, she said. I don't understand, your tracks were confusing, I said. I followed them down to the bridge but then they went back up to the campsite. We got some rest, the boy said. Then Uncle Roger came and said we were going. We left everything and slipped away to the boat. Rode across the river and left. I smiled. I'm very glad you did. He looked at me with expectant eyes. You said you found my dad? My face fell. I did, but it was too late. So, he's? I nodded somberly. Where is he? He's in my truck, but you don't want to see that. Before I could say another word, he ran to the truck and looked in the passenger's seat. A look of confusion fell over his eyes as he saw no one there. And then he slowly looked toward the bed of the truck. He stepped back and looked over the side into the bed. He instantly dissolved into tears and slid down the side of the truck sobbing. I'm so sorry, I said to the woman and man. She grabbed me and gave me a hug. Don't be, she said. Without you, we wouldn't have known for weeks, months, maybe even years what had happened. We would go on looking with false hope. You've given us a chance for closure and to properly grieve. She released me and I wiped my eyes. I looked at the man and walked down to the truck. He followed and we gently removed the body and laid him on the couch, then covered him with a blanket. The boy followed us back to the cabin but wouldn't look at me or anyone else. He sat in a chair and stared at the blanket covering his father's body. I knew I had done all I could, so I excused myself and started toward the door. I paused and said to the boy, I promise I'll make sure the thing never hurts anyone again. He looked up at me, eyes full of tears, and said, how will that help my dad? His mother opened her mouth but I held a hand up to silence her. I knew the boy was just hurting. I left without another word. On the drive back, I called the station and told them everything that had happened and told them I was going home and calling off for the following day. After getting home and stumbling into a shower and collapsing in bed, there was only one thought on my mind. I would return to Wolf Creek very soon with more and bigger guns. I would end that monster if it was the last thing I did. But that is another story. The sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows across the dense forest as I, an inexperienced hunter, trudged through the underbrush. I had always wanted to impress my father with my hunting skills, and this trip was my chance to prove myself. Little did I know that this day would change my life forever. As I made my way deeper into the woods, I spotted movement in the distance. My heart raced as I cautiously approached, my rifle trembling in my inexperienced hands. Through the trees, I saw what appeared to be a rare and endangered species, a majestic creature I couldn't quite identify. Without thinking, I raised my rifle and fired. The shot rang out through the forest, and the creature let out a heart-wrenching cry before collapsing to the ground. Horror washed over me as I realized what I had done. 
I had just shot a creature on the brink of extinction, and I knew the consequences could be severe. Panicking, I rushed to the fallen animal. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. Over long arms hung nearly to its feet, except that eight-inch claws jutted out from its long-haired fingers instead of fingernails. The creature was hairy all over with a sheen, silver-like hair, and it had human-like hairy feet, almost size 35. But what truly baffled me was its head, which resembled more that of a grizzly bear with a shorter but deeply scarred snout. These scars hinted at untold battles with beings even larger than itself. Yet, those piercing blue eyes projected a sense of ancient experience. Tears welled up in my eyes as I knelt beside the fallen creature. I felt a profound sense of guilt and remorse for what I had done. I knew I had to hide the evidence to avoid the consequences, so I dragged the lifeless body deeper into the woods and concealed it under a pile of fallen leaves and branches. Just as I finished hiding the evidence, I heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. My heart leapt into my throat as I turned to see a sight that sent chills down my spine. Emerging from the shadows was another creature, one even more terrifying than the one I had shot. It had those same overlong arms, claws, and the grisly bear-like head. Frozen with fear, I watched as the creature's piercing blue eyes locked onto me. It emitted a guttural growl that seemed to vibrate through the very ground beneath my feet. Without warning, the creature began to charge toward me, its powerful legs propelling it forward with astonishing speed. In a blind panic, I turned and sprinted through the dense forest. My heart pounded in my chest as I heard the creature's heavy footsteps closing in behind me. Branches scratched at my face, and roots threatened to trip me at every turn. I had never run so fast in my life, driven by pure terror. As I reached the edge of the forest, I burst into a clearing, gasping for breath. I looked back but saw no sign of the creature. Had I lost it? Or had it given up the chase? I couldn't be sure. I stumbled out of the woods and into our campsite, where my father and the rest of the hunting party were waiting. They could see the fear in my eyes and the dirt on my clothes. What happened, son? My father asked, concerned. I tried to catch my breath and compose myself. I, I saw something out there, something I can explain. It was a creature, like nothing I've ever seen before. And when I shot it, another one came after me. I barely escaped with my life. The other hunters exchanged worried glances. My father put a reassuring hand on my shoulder. We'll figure this out, son. We'll go back in the morning and see if we can find any trace of these creatures. That night, as we sat around the campfire, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over me. I knew what I had seen was real, and I knew that no one would believe me. I swore to myself that I would never forget that day in the forest, no matter how unbelievable it may seem. It was a story I would carry with me for the rest of my life, a true story of a hunter who had accidentally crossed paths with something beyond my wildest imagination. Logically, next morning we didn't find any trace of this creature. True story. Scariest thing that's ever happened to me was getting surprised by a moose. I was snowshoeing here in Colorado and I didn't notice the big guy lying in the snow behind some trees until he stood up. He stood up when I got right next to him like within arm's reach. I don't know if you've ever seen a moose but they're five. If they don't want you there, you're not going to be. He definitely didn't like me there and I immediately backed off. Only thing that really helped me was the fact that there were a few trees between us he had to walk around. If you've never snowshoed, it's a bit clumsy. Imagine trying to calmly walk backwards without falling into deep snow while a big angry moose is trotting towards you and you're wearing flippers. One wrong step and I'm getting stomped. By the time he gets around the trees I'm a solid 15 feet away. Still too close but far enough that he lets me continue to back off. I've run into many animals including bears and a big cat of some kind. This is the first time I truly felt in imminent danger. I was about 16 years old, 
deer hunting in some very thick and rugged terrain in West Virginia. I was driving through some thickets in a small draw, and you tend to be pretty keyed up when you're doing that because you're trying to be sneaky and silent, but if you flush a deer, you may only have a second or two to see if it's a buck and get a shot off before they disappear into the woods. I heard something moving off to my left, saw a flash of white and gray fur, about the right size, and without even thinking about it I had my rifle to my shoulder, thumb on the safety, and was trying to find antlers through the sights. It was an old man. Had to be in his 70s. This was almost 40 years ago, and I can still see every detail like I'd taken a photo. He was wearing dark green pants, a white shirt, a gray wool sweater, and had a gray felt hat on with a feather in the brim. He had an old pump-action 12-gauge shotgun he was using like a walking stick. I guess he'd never heard of Blaze Orange. In some kind of weird reflex action I flipped the safety off, sights right dead center on that old man's chest, then I guess there was a click of recognition and I flicked the safety right back on. Then I threw my rifle on the ground, sat down and threw up my breakfast and my lunch. I've only hiked at night once, intentionally. I was camping in the very southern tip of Illinois with a with a big group of people, 10 or so. It was a privately owned park, so we weren't allowed to leave out plots past 10 pm, but we all wanted to go stargazing at the lake. We waited till probably around midnight and left for the lake. If you've never experienced nighttime away from civilization, let me tell you, it gets dark. We all held hands and walked in a line because you quite literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We didn't use flashlights because we didn't want rangers to see us leaving camp so late. As we got closer to the lake we heard a non-animal make a trilling hooting sound? Imagine a baritone owl hooting into a fan, that's the best I can do to describe it ha ha. It was kinda creepy sounding, but we all just assumed it was a weird owl doing his thing. We were now in the tree line at the lake and the trilling had gotten louder and more aggressive sounding. We were all on edge and starting to think that maybe it wasn't an owl. Some of my friends laid down to look at the stars, but I was too freaked out to relax. The trilling got much closer and dirt and leaves were being thrown towards us from the tree line. Obviously not an owl at this point, we all decide to leave immediately. I'm shaking in fight or flight mode but unable to run because we all have to hold hands or someone might get lost. We decide to take a shortcut straight through the ranger station because it seems safer than taking the trail back, also because it's lit up. The trilling follows us for a bit, but stops once we pass the ranger station. I was never more relieved to get back to camp. Still no idea what kind of cryptid it was though. I googled online, and still wonder if it could be a mothman? Okay just know I absolutely love supernatural stuff. Which is partly why I like night hiking. But after this experience I'll stick to just reading stuff on the internet. So the original plan was we would go out in a group of 4 people or so but they all ended up cancelling. I am a stubborn person and still am so I stupidly decided to go alone. I know classic horror movie shit. So I got on the road and drove to the area I was planning on hiking but it ended up being closed. So I decided to again go to a different one I've never been on. I know I'm a total idiot y'all don't need to say it, so continuing that I started the hike listening to the one and only panic at the disco dancing's not a crime. When I heard someone. It sounded like one of the friends that was supposed to come so I again idiotically thought they decided last minute to come. I could hear it calling my name and telling me to slow down. Once it started getting closer I turned off my music and listened closer. If it was coming towards me it should sound clearer, which sent a chill down my spine. It honestly sounded distorted like a record player with someone's finger on it. I started getting real uncomfortable when I noticed it was coming from the way I was heading, not the way I came from. From what I remembered there were no other cars. I started walking back to my car which soon turned into a run. It continued to get louder and the moment I saw my car I booked it. 
I jumped in and again me being the idiot I am I decided to wait for it come out into the parking lot. I waited maybe 10 to 20 seconds when I saw this tall ass black figure. I'm really bad with scaling but it was probably maybe 7 feet 8 feet tall which is not humanly possible like hell nah bitch. I turned that car on and speed of. Got a speeding ticket later on but like better than getting eaten by a 7 foot tall bitch ass weirdo. I honestly don't know if it was people messing with me or some sort of demon. If y'all know WTF. The rocky dirt road crunched beneath the truck's tires as I drove through the dense forest, careful of the branches which overhung the path and scraped the windows. My eyes were darting around constantly, keeping an eye out for wildlife and fallen trees. This far into Yosemite, there weren't many people, but as a park ranger it's my job to patrol these woods and protect visitors from nature as much as possible. Not to mention protecting nature from them especially this time of year when unlicensed hunters are out, and clueless campers and amateur hikers are roaming alongside them. It's often a lethal combination. Just as I was thinking about amateur hikers, I saw a woman standing a little ways off the road. She was in a rock-strewn field on a slope leading up a hill to my left. Despite the fact that we were out in the middle of nowhere, she had no hiking equipment, no backpack, nothing. As I got closer, she saw me, but began to walk away, marching up the rocky slope. This far out in the middle of nowhere, I expected a wave or a hello at the very least. Most of the time if you're out here on foot you don't see anyone for days at a time. Hey, miss. Are you okay? I yelled, worrying she was suffering from exposure. Sometimes people get lost out in these woods and by the time you reach them they're nearly catatonic. I'd seen it before, men and women with a thousand yard stare. She didn't respond, instead continuing up the slope until she reached the top. Then she disappeared into the tree line. The woman's face looked familiar, I realized, and pulled up a file on my laptop. It showed people who had been reported missing in the area. It took a minute but eventually I found the woman's file. There were photos that matched the person I had just seen exactly. Except her clothes were different. And the woman had been reported missing eight months prior. She should look considerably worse, I thought, especially considering her lack of supplies. These woods were harsh, brutal wilderness. Even experienced hikers and hunters had become lost in the area and had died from the elements. I quickly called into the station and told them what I'd seen, then grabbed my backpack and took off on foot, running up the rocky slope towards the trees. If she continued at the pace she'd been moving, I had a good chance of catching up with her. At the top of the hill I managed to find her tracks. I followed them into the woods, tracing a path through the trees. For almost an hour I followed her path through the forest, becoming more and more convinced that I should have caught up with her. I realized something was wrong, and I had lost the trail. It was like the woman had vanished. I kept moving forward, thinking maybe I would pick up her tracks again. This happened sometimes, I knew as an amateur hunter. The quarry's path would disappear occasionally only to reappear a little ways away. So I kept going, pushing aside branches and shrubbery, and moving ever deeper into the overgrown wilderness. And that was when I saw it. What the hell is that? I muttered to myself, not believing my own eyes as the object came into focus up ahead. It was a staircase that appeared out of the overgrowth, looking otherworldly in this environment. What is this doing out here? I realized I was talking to myself but couldn't help it. I also couldn't seem to help the fact that I was steadily moving towards the staircase in the forest, despite a growing feeling which told me I should stay away. The closer I got to the stairs, the more I felt as if someone was watching me. The hair stood up on the back of my neck and goosebumps rose on my arms as I approached, moving closer and closer until I was standing right in front of it. Strangely enough, the stairs looked relatively new. They appeared unassuming and normal in every way, except for their odd location. The wood was not weather-worn or moss-coated. It was clean and I would guess it had been built in the last 10 or 20 years. 
but the staircase ended after exactly 13 steps. It was a staircase leading to nowhere. It was an eerie sight out here, since I was well aware of how difficult it would be to construct them in the middle of nowhere. What was the purpose of them? Who would build them and why? Even as I was asking myself these questions, I found myself walking up the stairs. It was like I was in a dream, as my feet seemed to move involuntarily upwards. But the feeling of eyes on the back of my neck grew worse and worse with each step. And I could feel the weight of someone else's movements on the stairs with me, I was sure of it. Eventually the paranoia became so overpowering that I had to turn around, feeling as if someone or something was definitely right behind me on the stairs. But when I turned around there was no one there. Suddenly I felt terrified as hell, and started wondering what I'd been thinking climbing those stairs in the woods that shouldn't have been there. I started going back down, still feeling eyes watching me from all around. The trees nearby rustled with movement and I saw a vague shape moving behind them. Hurrying the remainder of the way down the steps, I called out to the figure, thinking it was the woman I had seen earlier. Miss, if that you? I've been looking all over for you? Are you alright? I asked the dark figure in the shadows, but it didn't move or respond. Instead it just continued to watch me. Okay, lady, I can't help you if you don't. Suddenly it occurred to me that the figure in the shadows was too tall to be the woman I'd seen earlier. It looked to be a person at least six and a half feet tall, maybe more. And they were ducking behind a tree so as not to be seen clearly. The thing stood up even taller and I realized it had been crouched down. It was enormous, its form impossible to examine in the low light. But it was definitely watching me. And there were more of them, I realized, my heart pounding faster and harder until it felt like it was going to beat right out of my chest. I spun around, looking at the forest all around me, seeing shadow shapes everywhere. For a few long moments I was frozen, unable to move or breathe or think. And then I saw a long-fingered hand pushing back the foliage, preparing to emerge. That woke me up from my trance. Whatever these things were, I could tell they were not benevolent or good. They were creatures of darkness, luring people to them so they could feast on their minds. I tore my gaze away from it and began to run. Racing through the trees, I could sense them following after me. A platoon of lanky, impossibly tall creatures with long fingers. Were they the ones who had created the staircase out here? Were they aliens? Sasquatches? I had no idea, but every time I looked back over my shoulder I saw them gaining on me. Vague shapes moving so quickly they blurred and were tough to make out. That was when I realized it was getting dark outside. But that didn't make sense, since when I'd set out it had been the early morning hours, around 8 am checking my watch, I saw it was no longer functioning, nor were my cell phone or GPS devices working. With no other choice but to keep running, that's what I did bolting through the forest until eventually I found the rocky slope beside the dirt road where I'd left my truck. I ran right over the edge of the cliff, so terrified and frantic that I didn't see it coming. The things were just behind me by that point, and I was almost ready to resign myself to dying trying to fight them. Instead, I went tumbling down the rock-strewn hillside, somersaulting and hitting my elbows, knees, shoulders, and skull off the boulders and stones. A mini avalanche ensued and I went down hard, face planting as my feet were unable to keep up with my momentum. A sharp pain struck me in the forehead and I tasted blood in my mouth as my vision went dark. I laid in a pile of rubble and went to sleep. When I woke up, there was a park ranger standing over me, asking if I was okay. The weird thing was, I didn't recognize him. You look familiar, he said, furrowing his brow. What's your name? I told him and his jaw dropped, his face turning a shade paler. It can't be. Everybody thought you were dead. Looking around, I saw my truck was nowhere to be seen. It was a different season as well, the trees were turning slightly yellow when I went into the forest, an early signal of autumn. But now they were bright green as they would be at the beginning of summer. What's the date today? I asked him. He told me, 
but I didn't believe him at first. You're making that up, I said, shaking my head. I just went into the woods for a couple hours to find the woman. That's when I remembered her again. Did anyone find her? Or is she still missing? Nobody's seen any woman. Just like nobody has seen you for eight months. His eyes were suspicious and I realized he thought I was losing my mind. Or had lost it out in the forest. I shook my head and looked back into the woods. We gotta get a search party out there. Didn't you hear me? If you saw a woman when you went out there, she's long gone by now. My eyes stayed fixed firmly on the trees in the distance. Not for her. There's something else out there. I couldn't resist the pull of it and started wandering back up the rocky slope. It felt like I was an iron filing and that staircase was a strong magnet, drawing me towards it. We all need to go to it. The other ranger grabbed my arm and pulled me back, restraining me, yelling at me to calm down. It took five more men to get me to stop, and to get me into the hospital. They keep telling me what I saw wasn't real. That I was suffering from exposure. That I got lost in the forest and hit my head, suffering a concussion. The doctors say I hallucinated all of it. But I know what I saw. And as soon as I get out of this hospital, I'm going back. My family and I have always been drawn to the great outdoors. There's something about the call of the wilderness that stirs our souls. I, Mark, have a passion for hiking, instilled in me by my own father. My wife, Lisa, cherishes the tranquility of nature, and our two children, Emily and Jake, are growing up with a deep love for the woods. One crisp autumn morning, we decided to embark on a hiking adventure deep into the heart of a secluded forest. The towering pines, vibrant foliage, and the promise of a peaceful escape from the hectic city life filled us with excitement. We loaded our pickup truck with camping gear, provisions, and our faithful Labrador, Max. The forest was known to be remote, untouched by modern conveniences, and it was exactly what we were looking for. After hours of driving on winding, unpaved roads, we reached the trailhead. Tall trees blocked the sun, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The air was crisp, carrying the earthy scent of moss and leaves. It was exactly as we had hoped, an escape from the chaos of our daily lives. We started our hike with me leading the way, Lisa and the kids in tow, and Max, the excited dog, bounding ahead, barking with joy. The trail led us deeper into the woods, and with each step, we felt the modern world slipping away. As the day wore on, we marveled at the natural beauty surrounding us. The vibrant reds and oranges of the leaves, the babbling brooks, and the chirping of birds filled our senses. We paused by a clear, babbling creek to enjoy a simple picnic lunch, our laughter echoing through the serene forest. But as the sun dipped below the horizon and the forest grew dark, the atmosphere changed. The trees seemed to close in, their rustling leaves now ominous whispers. I checked my GPS, which showed that we were miles from the nearest trailhead or civilization. Then, we heard it, a distant, eerie cry that sent shivers down our spines. Max, our usually fearless companion, whimpered and retreated closer to the family. The forest, once so inviting, now felt like a realm of unknown danger. Our unease deepened when we stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a creature that defied explanation. It was taller than the pickup by easily a couple of feet. Its body was black, surrounding the white of the bones, with long arms half stretched to its sides, as if it was saying, try and hit me. It was definitely three-dimensional, tall with long arms, and dark. Dead looking. Like light was sucked into it without reflecting anything. Its face was a haunting deer skull, devoid of eyes but with empty sockets that seemed to seep darkness. The creature exuded an aura of malevolence that paralyzed us with fear. Before we could react, the creature lunged at us with unearthly speed. Panic surged through our family as we turned and sprinted back into the woods. The predator pursued us relentlessly, its eerie cries echoing through the trees. My instincts kicked in, 
and I led my family deeper into the forest, veering off the trail to evade our pursuer. We navigated through the dense underbrush, branches snapping, and leaves crunching beneath our feet. Emily and Jake clung to Lisa and me, tears streaming down their faces. Hours passed, and exhaustion weighed us down, but we dared not stop. We could still hear the creature behind us, its presence a constant threat. With the moon high in the sky and our bodies pushed to the limits, our family found a small cave, its entrance partially hidden by overgrown shrubs. We squeezed inside, our hearts pounding, and remained huddled in the darkness, praying that the creature had lost our trail. Outside the cave, we could hear the guttural growls and rustling of leaves as the predator searched for us. Ours turned into a long, restless night as we listened to its haunting cries echoing through the forest. But the creature's presence eventually faded, and the forest fell silent. Exhausted and terrified, we allowed ourselves a fitful sleep, our dreams haunted by the bone-chilling encounter. The job of Yosemite Park Ranger isn't what most people imagine. A lot of people picture us as law enforcement types, handing out tickets and enforcing park rules, when really that's a very niche aspect of it. Mostly we're just here to assist you. Handing out maps, not speeding tickets, and giving people directions to the best views or to ideal camping locations. We remind people about safety and weather conditions from day to day. But the main thing we do, and this is more vital than people realize, is that we're just here in case anyone gets lost or hurt. We deal with a lot of belligerent people who like to think the park is their personal playground where they can do whatever they want. It's my job to remind them to follow the rules. To dispose of their trash properly, to pick up after their dog and to clip its leash back on while walking the trails. Some people take this as a personal assault on their freedoms, when really I'm just looking out for the safety of other visitors, like cyclists and horseback riders who share the paths. Dogs can be unpredictable and can misbehave on trails, and we have to look out for everyone. Still, I don't often get a lot of positive feedback for enforcing the rules. Nobody likes to be told what to do, trust me, I get it. Every once in a while something interesting happens to break up the boredom and monotony of the job. Last summer I was walking around at night, doing a patrol of the campgrounds, when I saw something rustling around in the bushes. A guy came crawling out, dressed in a furry dog costume. I asked him if he was okay and he just barked happily, then crawled away in the opposite direction. Shortly afterwards, I saw him chasing another person who was dressed as a cat, a woman who went scampering away and hid beneath a camper van, laughing excitedly and making purring sounds, licking the dirt from her fur pants with a long tongue. She saw me watching and clawed the air in front of her face, hissing territorially. It's not how I would choose to spend my Friday nights, but I'm not one to judge. By far the most interesting thing which has ever happened to me at Yosemite occurred last summer. And it wasn't just interesting. It was utterly terrifying. Every night when I fall asleep I have nightmares about that day. Every time I close my eyes, I picture those dark tunnels in the rock face. It all started when someone called in a report saying they were out on the Cathedral Lake Trail when their brother went missing. The pair had been out hiking when they got separated somehow. At first we thought it was just a routine mishap. People go missing in Yosemite all the time. It's no big deal in most cases since usually the missing parties are found quickly enough. Half the time alcohol is involved and I have to remind people to pace themselves if they indulge while camping. But every once in a while those missing people don't turn up, and we have to dispatch much larger search parties. In this case I went out on my own at first, heading to where the man had called us from. I drove out on an ATV, since it was a 16 mile round trip. When I got there, the guy looked frantic. He ran over to me and started speaking way too fast to understand. I told him to slow down, and just give me the facts. It's important to stay calm in these types of situations. The guy took a deep breath and let it out. Then he started talking again, a bit slower this time. We were walking on the trail. 
He was right beside me. Then I turned around to look at the lake and when I looked back he was gone. Just gone. I tried to get a sense if the man had been drinking or doing drugs. It's not that I'm trying to assume the worst in people, but we have to think of these types of things. The simplest explanation is usually the right one, after all. And it was much easier to imagine the two brothers taking sips from a Mickey and one of them getting separated and lost than to imagine one of them being abducted by aliens, or taken in a very selective rapture. Slow down for a second. Take some deep breaths. What's your name, let's start with that. Greg, he said, his face turning a shade less purple as he began to inhale air with trembling breaths in and out. Okay, Greg. I took out my notepad, jotting this down, along with his last name which I'll leave out for the sake of privacy. And what's your brother's name? Dave, he said, sniffling. I saw he had been crying recently. Where was the last place you saw your brother? Let's retrace your steps. He started protesting, saying that wasn't going to help, but I convinced him we had to at least try. Greg led me back a little ways to where he'd seen his brother last. I walked back here already. And I looked all around here before calling you guys. I thought maybe he went off the trail to take a leak and tripped, hit his head. Something like that, I don't know. I was grasping at straws. But I think something. He hesitated. Something what? I probed. Do you think something took him? Like those stories you hear about? He sounded embarrassed, but I tried to get more out of him and asked him which stories he was talking about. You know, you hear stories about Yosemite and other national parks. I'm sure you've heard about them. Even if you're not in on the conspiracy. Stories where people go missing like this, and it makes no sense. Someone turns their back for a second and their son or their sister or whoever is just gone. Disappeared, like Dave. I saw it on YouTube. Aha, uh -huh, I replied. Not sure what corner of the internet this guy had been visiting. Well, that doesn't happen around here, I can assure you. Let's keep looking, I'm sure he'll turn up. But the longer we looked, the less we found. It really did seem like the man's brother had just vanished. I was about to call in for more support, maybe even a K-9 unit, when the man yelled from a little ways off the trail, saying he'd found something. Following the sound of his voice, I eventually came to find him at the base of the mountain, face to face with the granite wall. At first I didn't understand what he was doing there, but as I got closer I saw there was actually a cave which was well hidden in the rock face. It blended in perfectly with the mountainside until you were almost nose to nose with the pale grey stone. Good job, I said, patting him on the shoulder. But then I looked at our surroundings, getting nervous. We were pretty far from the path, in the thick part of the forest which was overgrown and tangled with vines and shrubbery. Do you think he would have gone into this cave on his own? Greg looked around, as if checking to see if his brother had left a message for him. But there was nothing. I don't think so. It's not like him to just leave me on the trail alone, either. Especially not for this long. If this was a prank or something he'd have come back by now. I can tell something's not right. Has your brother played pranks on you like this before? I asked. The man was in his 20s, and his brother was probably of a similar age. Young men occasionally got lost or injured trying to scare each other by pulling pranks or filming videos in the woods. It was rare but it had happened before. Once or twice, he admitted. I didn't call you guys for a while because I thought he was messing with me. I wouldn't put it past him. But not for this long. I was getting annoyed. Mosquitoes were biting my neck and I was sweating in the heat of the afternoon, after marching through the foliage for hours. I imagined the guy hiding inside the cave trying to scare his younger brother. Maybe he had fallen asleep in his dark hiding place or he was just pushing it too far, but either way, I was upset. If this was a prank, it had wasted most of my afternoon. It probably annoyed me even more because I had my own older brother who had played tricks on me more than once in our younger days, and this was bringing back memories. Alright. You can come out of there right now, I yelled, marching into the cave, 
thinking the young man would be hiding in the small alcove. I turned a corner and saw a dark tunnel, leading deep into the darkest recesses of the granite. This made no sense. As far as I knew, there was no tunnel in this location. Especially not one of this size. But it had been well hidden. Nearly invisible in the rock face. I wondered if anyone knew about it. And I wondered if it was safe. I didn't feel comfortable going any further. The dark space looked like it went on for a long, long way into the distance, and I was getting an eerie feeling standing there. It felt like I could almost hear voices whispering from all around me. The words were lost in the echoing cave, and I got a strong sensation that we weren't alone, like icy fingers walking slowly up my spine. The other man came in behind me, marveling at the cave for a second before continuing to press forward. Come on, Greg said, forging ahead. He might be in trouble. He was anxious to keep going. Not scared enough of this horrifying place with whispering voices coming from the shadows. And his apparent lack of fear made me twice as scared. I'm going back for help, I said, shuffling backwards. It isn't safe. Nobody knows we're here. My training and my instincts were overwhelming my curiosity, but Greg seemed not to care about the dangers. The man continued going forward, disappearing into the darkness. A few seconds later he was gone, and there was no indication he had ever existed in the first place. Greg? I called out into the black abyss. There was no response. He might as well have been a ghost. An overwhelming urge to follow him rushed over me, and I took a few steps forward, feeling hypnotized by that black tunnel leading on and on forever. But then I shook my head, slapping my face as I tried to wake myself up from whatever trance I was in which was overruling my common sense. I turned around and left the cave, my legs shaking and my hands unsteady as I called for assistance. After meeting the search party back at the trail, we went through the woods again to find the cave hiding within the 10,000 foot tall rock face of Cathedral Peak. But it was gone. I remembered having trouble finding it the first time, and thinking it was well hidden among the pale grey surface of the mountainside. You had to be nearly face to face with the wall to see it, since it was so invisible among the crags and boulders. I tried to tell my supervisor and the other members of the search party, but they didn't believe me. They said there was no tunnel there. They looked for hours and found nothing. Helicopters swept the area and more teams with more dogs, bloodhounds and German shepherds. But nothing was turned up. There was no trace of anyone else having been out there, except me. Dumbfounded for the rest of the week, and for the rest of the summer, I couldn't focus on anything. My mind kept going back to that conversation I'd had with the man on the trail named Greg. The man who'd lost his brother and then disappeared into a cave that didn't exist. More and more, I began to wonder what would have happened if I'd followed him. It took a full year for me to build up the courage to go back out to that exact spot again. It happened to be on the same date, and around the same time of day. Only this time, I wasn't on duty. It was my weekend off, so I had plenty of time to comb the area for clues. My backpack was full of provisions and I had enough to last for a night or two in the woods, maybe longer if necessary. Somehow I knew. I just had a feeling that if I went back on that day at that time it would be there. The cave that didn't exist. Cathedral Peak loomed above me, getting larger as I made my way through the forest, moving toward it. The grey clouds above were shrouding the sun in darkness, while the thickening canopy blocked any remaining light from overhead. A chill ran through me, causing me to shiver involuntarily as I laid eyes on the black hole in the rock face, so plain and clear to see now. Taking a step forward, I found myself standing right in front of it, and I reached up my hands to feel the outline of the entryway, as if to confirm it was real. It was. I took a deep breath, like a diver about to submerge, and went inside. The air was cold and damp, with a strange, coppery smell. My flashlight was on my belt and I grabbed it, but then decided not to turn it on. I was getting a strange feeling, like I was in an unsafe place, and needed to stay silent and hidden. There was a sound coming from up ahead which I couldn't place. 
It was a slurping, chewing sound. Like someone tearing meat from bones with their teeth. As I went deeper and deeper into the tunnel, the air became colder, and so damp that I felt droplets of water running down my face and into my eyes. A trickle of light was filtering in somewhere as well, causing the cavern to faintly glow in places. The air seemed to shimmer and dance in front of my eyes as I went deeper and deeper, feeling entranced as I stumbled along in the shadows. Faintly I realized that there was something wrong with me, as if I had been drugged, but I no longer cared. In fact, I found the sensation to be quite pleasant. And then I was abruptly awoken from my daydream as I came around a corner and saw the horror unfolding within the guts of Cathedral Peak. I can't possibly explain what I saw down there. And the shadows obscured most of it, drenching the monstrous creature in darkness. But the impression I got was of something like an octopus or a squid, crossbred with an oversized plant or a fungus, sucking and slurping, chewing and crunching something between its teeth. After a few moments of inspection, I realized it was a person's face that was being eaten, as the details could just barely be seen in the dim light of the cave. The skin was being stripped from its cheeks, the eyelids ripped off, and the lips peeled back and slurped up like noodles. Tentacles like tangled vines were everywhere, slithering and sliding across the pale gray stone floor all around me. At first I thought it was mud beneath my feet, but as I came fully to my senses I realized it was blood mingling and mixing with the dust beneath my feet, creating a dark, toxic red slurry which sucked at my boot heels. The tentacle vine things were everywhere, I realized with numb shock. My feet were actually stepping on some of them and I was amazed the creature hadn't noticed me yet. But it was obviously too caught up with whatever meal it was currently ingesting. Feeling very glad I hadn't turned on my flashlight, I began to back away very slowly, my boots crunching across the writhing tentacles. A sick knot in my stomach was rising up and threatening to make me puke, fear and revulsion twisting my gut. My mind was spinning and my thoughts were racing, understanding there was a very good chance I would never leave this place. I tried desperately not to step on any more of the squirming, writhing tentacles which moved and twisted on the floor of the cave, soaking and basking in the blood which had been spilled everywhere, like pigs rolling happily in the mud. There was no possible way there could be so much of it, I thought. No one person has this much blood. This is like a river. And then I saw the others. They were hanging suspended from the ceiling, from the walls, from everywhere. Amidst the purple, vine tentacles, they breathed in and out, still being kept alive, but just barely. Dozens of them were strung up and down the length of the cave, their chests rising and falling with weak breaths, but none of them opening their eyes or speaking. It was like they were sleeping. After a few long moments of searching, I found him. Greg. The hiker from the trail who was looking for his brother. He was hanging upside down from the wall just beside me, his eyes closed. Parts of him were missing, a piece of his cheek, part of his hand, but the wounds were slowly healing. The creature, whatever it was, kept its victims alive down there, I realized. It was ingesting them slowly, perhaps even using pieces of its other victims as nutrients to feed the ones who were dying of starvation, like an otherworldly pyramid scheme built of blood and human remains. Shaking that mental image away, I grabbed Greg's shoulder, hoping to wake him up quietly. His eyes shot open a second after I touched him, revealing only the whites, and he began to screech. And I don't mean screeching like he was screaming out of fear of pain or anything like that. This was an inhuman alarm cry which signified to me immediately that there was no shred of humanity left in him. He was now a part of the hive mind of the creature and its tentacle army. As his head turned on a swivel I saw smaller tentacles were wrapped around him, going into his brain and into his neck, invading his ears and eyes, and drilled into his spinal column. I screamed involuntarily, seeing these details, and heard the creature in the tunnel as it recognized my presence. It wasn't fast, whatever it was, but it was huge. The cave shook around me, dust and pebbles falling from the stone ceiling above as I backed away from the hiker. Beneath my feet the vines were suddenly moving quickly, 
sliding around so that I couldn't find my balance. As soon as my shoes found purchase on the stone floor beneath me, I began to run. The tunnel was alive all around me now, the whipping vines twisting and bending toward me, reaching out like greedy hands trying to grab me as I raced past. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the amorphous creature's central girth was finding its way through the cave and was moving my way a lot faster than I would have thought possible. But then again, I wouldn't have thought any of this was possible before living it. The light of the entryway was just up ahead, and I could smell the fresh air, and could see the sun. Then my feet suddenly slipped as if someone had pulled a rug out from under me and I went crashing to the ground face first. My jaw closed hard and bit the end of my tongue, causing it to bleed, the taste of copper filling my mouth a second later. I tried to get to my feet, the mental image of those poor, trapped people could be seen clearly in my mind's eye. In retrospect, I think the creature, whatever it was, needed us to be unsuspecting. If we were aware of what it was doing, its hypnosis wouldn't work. Maybe it was a chemical it released which caused people to want to explore the cave, a pheromone like insects used to communicate. But it didn't work as well if you knew about it, and if you understood its purpose. It released some more of that pheromone or whatever chemical it was using to lure people in, and I actually felt my legs grow a bit heavier. My eyelids, too. It was like I had suddenly just worked three night shifts, and really needed to sleep. But then the wave of hypnosis passed and I felt the rumbling of the ground beneath me and that broke me from the trance again, causing me to scramble to my feet from the cave floor and run. As I neared the cave entrance and sprinted toward it, leaving my backpack far behind in an effort to lighten the load, I saw the rocks were actually closing in, tightening the gap. The entryway was shrinking somehow. It was the vines, I realized. They were what was camouflaging the entrance their color changing to match the pale gray stone. I picked up my pace, the twisting forms beneath me making it even more difficult. I didn't dare risk a glance over my shoulder, feeling the rumbling of the floor and knowing that the bulk of the creature was just behind me, closing in. With the gap of the exit narrowing even further, shrinking to the size of a dartboard, I dove headfirst into it. Imagining my face slamming into a sheer rock wall as it suddenly turned to stone right in front of me, sealing me in this dark labyrinth of suffering forever with the rest of these tortured souls. My eyes were squinted tightly shut as I felt the vines pulling and tearing at me as I went through the gap. For an instant they squeezed in around my midsection, threatening to stop me like Winnie the Pooh after an unfortunate attempt at pilfering honey when I popped out of the hole and it sealed up behind me in an instant. I heard a loud crash as the creature flew headlong into its own obstruction. The trap it had created for me to keep me there had hindered its escape, preventing it from chasing after me. I could hear it thrashing and clawing at the vines, desperate for more flesh to sustain itself. Whatever it was, it was growing too large even for its own control. Left alone to feed in the heart of the mountain, it would eventually destroy itself. It would consume its own flesh to sate its monstrous hunger, like a snake eating its own tail. I had a very strong suspicion that it was true. With that very specific idea in mind, I wandered back to my car. It was easier now without the backpack and all the gear. But the walk back to the cave would be harder. There would be lots to carry next time. After a trip to the hardware store, I went back out to the trail. It was nighttime now, and the place was abandoned. I borrowed one of the Ranger ATVs and took my supplies out to the spot where the cave had been. After bringing a few buckets of water from the lake, I began my work. Since I had marked the cave, it was easy to find it again, and to begin laying down the fast drying cement. As park rangers, our job is usually to stop people from vandalizing mountains in this way but I got the feeling Mother Nature would forgive me. It was my job to protect this place, and the people who visited. And nothing could protect people from this thing. It was best to seal it away forever, and let it slowly consume itself. Without a fresh supply of hikers, it would eventually run out of calories. It would eventually expire. It was only a matter of time. The vine tentacle squirmed beneath the layer of cement, 
groggily reaching out for me, trying to pull me in. I grabbed the trowel and slopped on another thick coating and watched as it rapidly began to dry. And the tentacles began to smooth out and settle down again, falling back asleep. That inhuman shriek could be heard from inside again, much louder this time. As if all of the hikers who the creature had abducted had all woken up at the same instant, and for just a second, realized their predicament. Sorry, Greg, I muttered to myself, alone in the dark forest. I told you not to go in there. This event occurred in northwestern Ohio in the summer of 2018. I was camping with my brother along Lake Erie near the Pickerel Creek Wildlife Area just west of our home in Sandusky, Ohio. So, that first night, we went to sleep early. I woke up at around 2.30 am. Because I had to take a leak. My brother was fast asleep. The moon was almost full that night so it gave off plenty of light for me to see everything outside the tent. There weren't many bushes in the area around our campsite so I didn't have to worry or be afraid of something hiding and waiting to sneak up on me. I was walking away from our camp when I saw something that scared the crap out of me not far from me. There were two dog-like creatures just standing there staring at me. When I say standing, I mean on two legs. I completely freaked out and I started running back to the tent. I heard what sounded like they were chasing after me and making the strangest noises. Not so much a dog or wolf sound but more of something like a human. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. I was too afraid to turn around. I thought that at any second they would pounce on me and attack but that never happened. When I did make it back to the tent I dove into it. I scared the crap out of my brother who asked what was going on. I told him what had just happened. He gave me a strange look and then laughed, telling me to shut up. I told him if he didn't believe me to go out there himself and see. He laughed again and said, sure thing. I have to go anyway. So I sat there and I watched him stand up and head out of the tent. I knew that this was serious and I couldn't let him go out there by himself, so I followed him out of the tent and into the darkness. My eyes took a few seconds to adjust but I could see him standing about 20 yards away staring off at the trees. I walked over next to him and I looked in that direction too. We were staring into pitch black woods, but then as my eyes adjusted I could see something in the shadows. It was a part dog part man creature. It didn't move or growl it just stood there upright and looking at us. The dog part, the upper half, looked like a German shepherd but with yellow eyes and a dog-like head. The human part started about mid-torso downward. It was standing there on two legs like a man. The upper part was hairy like a dog but the bottom half was hairless like a human man. I whispered to my brother and asked what he thought it was. He said nothing. He was literally paralyzed with fear and shock. I grabbed him and pulled him back to the tent. As we ran back, the creature let out a horrific howl. The sound of that thing echoed through the trees. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. We dove into the tent and piled our backpacks and gear in front of the entrance as if this would offer us protection. We were both absolutely terrified. He was shaking and I felt like I had to throw up. I asked him what we should do now and he said that he didn't know but if this thing got in our tent it would kill us for sure. Then we heard a dog howl in the distance and we started to feel relieved, even though I knew that it may have been the second creature that I had encountered earlier. Then it was answered by another howl closer to us like, right outside the tent. It had followed us. We then heard scratching and digging sounds. We were both screaming hysterically at this point. Then it stopped and there was nothing but silence. We waited inside the tent for at least 15 minutes, hoping that it had left. We decided to risk it and peek outside the tent. I grabbed the flashlight and peeked through the flap. I saw nothing. I waited a bit longer, but then I looked out into the campsite. There was nothing there. We decided to stay put in the tent until daylight. There was no way that we were going to walk through the dark woods toward my car in an attempt to escape these creatures. After what seemed like forever, the morning light started creeping through the forest canopy. We both slowly exited the tent and looked around us. 
There were large canine and human-like prints all around the campsite, especially in a circle around the tent. We quickly gathered all of our gear and started to hike quickly toward my car, which was parked in a lot about a half mile away. When we reached the car, the first thing that I noticed was a terrible stench. I didn't know what it was but the odor was very strong. It was so strong that we smelled it after we got it and drove off. My brother believes that the creatures may have found the car and marked it as theirs. I wasn't sure if that was true but the stench lingered in the car for days. When I got home, after dropping my brother off at his apartment, I started looking online in an attempt to find answers. I read several accounts about dogman sightings throughout Ohio, but none were from the area where we had been. That was five years ago. My brother and I still enjoy the outdoors, but we have not returned to the area of our encounter. We are both more aware of our surroundings when hiking and camping. But we just do not talk about the encounter with each other. Used to go on holiday to the south of France every year with my parents, they were big into walking and seeing the surrounding areas so my sister and I would always be dragged along with them. There was one time we had stopped to eat dinner at the top of a mountain, probably one of the longest walks we'd been on since my sister and I were only around 10 and 12 years old. Whilst we were sat on some boulders eating, this old French lady, probably around 70 years old, approached my parents and asked if they could show her the way down the mountain as she was looking for her husband. Bear in mind this was a very isolated spot and we hadn't seen any other people on this entire walk. My parents were confused how such an elderly old lady had made it so far up the mountain in such heat and no hiking gear. They attempted to communicate with her and see if she had any explanation of how she got there but she insisted that she just needed to find her husband. As we started walking back down the mountain she began to follow us. All of my family were wearing hiking boots and using sticks to aid us in our descent as the path was incredibly steep and we all slipped many times. The old lady however, did not struggle, she followed us down without misplacing a step. The creepiest thing about her though, was that the entire way down all she would say was ooh la la any time any of my family slipped or seemed to struggle finding the right place to put our feet. Once we reached the bottom of the mountain and were on the path back to the car park, she said, thank you and began following the path we had taken to get to the top of the mountain. She is now referred to in my family as the ooh la la woman. This happened to me in the early 2000s. It was nearing 4.45 am and I was taking some time by the Willamette River before stores opened. I was living in Eugene, Oregon. The spot I chose to stop and rest was next to the famous Owen Rose Garden Park and Interstate 5 ran overhead. I was underneath and next to the river. It was springtime and the temperature was cold but not freezing. I put my back against one of the support beams from the highway and rested. That's when I noticed some strange things going on across the river from where I was, maybe 50 feet on the bank. I saw two tall, thin but very muscular, mantis insect beings on the other bank. I'm nauseated writing this now. The first one was less than 10 feet from the water's edge, not moving at all but eyes were open, glassy like mirrors. There was a person there, on the ground, face down and looking like maybe he fell? Then I noticed the second hellion. I hadn't noticed him before because he wasn't all that clear. This creature was beating forward and back really quickly. He was leaning over another body. The body didn't move but this thing did. Very fast. A blur actually. I became afraid at this point and slid my butt forward so my head and vision would go down. That's when I heard strange talking. I also heard the banging of metal on concrete. I looked up, I didn't want to, and saw what looked like a white, bald man with big black sunglasses. He was looking from behind the pillar barely 15 feet away from me. We just looked at each other and then I began sliding down as far as I could go and not see him. I thought to myself, the hell with this. I gathered my courage and jumped up, grabbed my bike, and began riding as fast as I could in order to get away. 
Right after I started riding, I started throwing up. It was way too much for me. But then something flashed right by me in hyper speed. All I saw was this disturbance in the air. I said out loud, what the hell was that? To feel safe, I ended up at our hospital sitting in the ER lobby. There was a car going around and around the block until about 6 6 30 am. The windows were fogged but I could see three outlines. Were they lost? I'm not sure. I went back two days later and there was nothing to stand on behind the pillar of the guy with glasses. The pillar goes right into the river. Also, I couldn't find any tracks on the other side, but it did look dug up. Like a dozer or something. There were also others in line, going up to the highway. I couldn't figure out where they were going. I was born in Traverse City, Michigan, and lived there until 1993. It was the fall of 1991 and I had been at a friend's house. I was coming back to my house and as I walked up toward my house I saw the curtains in my living room window pulled aside and someone look out at me. As I walked through the front door I came to realize no one was home. I was confused because I had clearly seen the curtain pulled back and a face looked out at me. I looked around the house and started down the hall toward my bedroom. The whole time I was thinking one of my brothers was playing with me and I was expecting them to hop out. My mother's room was at the end of the hall. Near the lower right edge of her door, I saw what I thought was our cat peering around the corner at me. A dark face low to the ground. I called to the cat and then stood frozen as the face rose about four feet. I still get chills from the image in my mind. It wasn't the cat. It was something else. I remember this feeling in my legs that they wouldn't move. They were cemented to the floor like in nightmares. I felt chills run down my spine to my feet and I bolted through the front door as fast as I could. I ran to the dirt driveway and stood still unsure what to do or where to go. Suddenly I saw my mom and brothers and our car in the driveway. I had to shake off the feeling that I wasn't alone anymore but also that the daylight was suddenly gone. Somehow it had gone from day to night and I had no memory of it. I don't remember my family pulling into the drive. Some call this missing time. Mine wasn't just missing, it was non-existent. Through the years I have had a recurring dream about this event and it becomes clearer as I get older. I remember my room and my bed. I remember staring out the window at night as I fell asleep and often seeing strange lights. I would mention these to my family and faced constant ridicule for it. This also occurred when I was much younger and my mother would try to explain them as simple tricks of the eyes. Light from cars or something in my peripheral vision seemed brighter than they really were. Many nights during my summer vacations, from the years 1994 to 1996, I would lay out after our bonfires and look at the stars. I had a fascination with counting satellites and seeing shooting stars. There were times I can remember seeing what I thought were satellites and following them and they're heading only to see them waver and change direction. I can also recall seeing what I thought were multiple satellites in formation. This all sounds ridiculous I know but I'm almost 40 now and this is still with me. I carry it with me like a dark secret. I guess I'm looking for advice on this. I've heard there are therapy options or even hypnosis, although I'm a huge skeptic of hypnosis, being used to remember events. Here's a story you can use if you want. When I was in my teens, probably 14 or 15, I remember tossing and turning in my bed in the early morning. I opened my eyes for a split second while turning over like most people do, and I swear to God I saw a small gnome, gremlin-like creature sitting on my shelf watching me illuminated by the bluish early morning light coming in through the windows. It was about one foot tall, grayish brown, wearing just a simple tunic on its torso and that's it. It looked a bit like an elf from the Harry Potter movies, but they hadn't been released yet, so that image couldn't have been implanted in my brain, as if I was just dreaming this little creature was sitting there. I remember it was sitting with its legs crisscrossed, with its right hand resting on its left knee. It smiled at me, 
waved very excitedly, and smiled a big toothy grin like he was some long lost friend happy to see me. Looking back on it, it seemed genuinely nice. I didn't sense any negativity or evil from it at all. I remember seeing it, knowing I was awake, and not thinking anything of it. Upon waking up though, I was creeped out. Did I really see that or was I just half asleep and still dreaming? In my area of New England, near the Bridgewater Triangle, there are stories of puckwudgies, which are from Native American folklore. Basically small impish trickster type creatures. My father was also an avid collector of Native American artifacts like beads, pottery, and arrowheads, so maybe it was some sort of forest spirit hanging out of my house. This is not a UFO sighting, but something I feel is related and very interesting. After watching a program about a man with something in his body, they extracted it and did not know what it was. I immediately recognized the object and even now, I'm getting tingly just writing about it. I was about 16 years old, living in Burnaby, British Columbia, and I was rubbing my calf with my hands as I felt something. I looked closer to find there was something embedded in the right side of my leg below the knee. I tried to get a hold of it with my fingers, but it was too smooth and pointy to get a grip. My mother had a pair of tweezers close by. I propped my leg up on the bathtub. I pinched it with the tweezers and began to pull. I was shocked to see this thing in my leg being so long and pointy, yet I felt no pain. After I pulled it out, there was no blood, but only a hole. I looked at it closely and I can remember it being very similar to a thin yet long and pointy piece of rice. It had a gold, brown color to it and was very hard. I didn't think much of it at the time as I was only 16. The best is yet to come. Frequently, over the next several years, I marveled at the hole. I looked at it, felt it, and didn't go away. For another couple of years, I forgot about it. Then once again, I remembered it. I looked at it and saw another object in the very same hole. I got up and looked for some tweezers. After finally finding some, I pulled it out again. It was identical to the one I pulled out the first time. Again, I was stupid and did not think to save the piece. It has been about 20 years since I pulled the last one out, and still think of it. I still look at it, but it hasn't returned. The only thing I have left is a groan and hole, that you still can see. I joke about it to the people I tell and even show them the hole. I tell them the people planning this bug on me, finally got sick and tired of me removing it. In October 2016, Ray Dove claims that she and two friends traveled to the Joshua Tree National Park to camp. All of them had an interest in ufology and hoped something would happen on their trip. On the first night, while lying in her tent, Dove was awakened by a large bug crawling across her face. Thinking it might be a spider, she immediately sprang up grabbed the bug off her face, and tossed it. I could hear it hit the side of the tent, it was that big, she noted. She began to fall back asleep. She felt guilty, or something and thought about removing the bug from the tent but was tired. I suddenly woke up again feeling that same squishy bug walking across my face however this time with more composure and care I gently pulled the mystery bug off my face. I did that and placed it on the floor of my tent and shined my flashlight on it to see what it actually was. It was the largest ant I have ever seen. It must have been half an inch long. She noted that it was a transparent golden color. Not your normal everyday red and black little ants walking around, for sure. This ant definitely didn't resemble the little red ants I had seen earlier that day outside our camp. She gently scooped it up and put it outside. That morning they all left. The very next day, a Saturday, they decided to return that night and do another camp out. They went off the main road far into the heart of the park. It was a bumpy dirt road in the middle of nowhere. We found a spot next to a small dried out wash to one side of us and tall bushes surrounding us. We set up our chairs facing each other as we meditated, something we practice in order to raise our consciousnesses for sharper perception, 
she noted. Soon, the person sitting to her left, via his third eye vision, told her that two bright basketball-sized light flashes were going off next to her about three feet off the ground and 15 minutes apart. Dove, of course, could not see anything but she began to feel something and it was weird. I could feel in the back of my head this is similar to what some would refer to as hair raising. It felt like someone was standing directly behind me. About this time I said out loud, they are here. The person seated next to Dove noted that he could feel them too. We didn't know who they were but intuitively knew that non-human beings were very near us. We could feel their presence. Dove attempted to communicate in her mind, and at one point felt a connection though it felt emotionless. This being felt void of any strong feelings that I could pick up on although there did seem to be a hint of curiosity on his part, she recalled. With my eyes closed I saw the being, with what some would call your third eye or intuitive vision. I only saw the outlining shape of the being's head. It was like that of an elongated upside down triangle. At the same time the person sitting next to me also intuitively picked up on a feeling of an insect with an elongated upside down triangular head, as well. Then with my eyes still closed, I saw in my inner vision an approaching tall maybe six foot non-human being walking down the wash that was directly in front of me up towards the person to my left. Surprised, I opened my eyes and could still see the being approaching. According to Dove, the being seemed to be phasing in and out ever so slightly as he walked. He had his head turned to the side looking directly at me. It was as if he was not actually touching the ground as he walked but was gliding over it smoothly like on an elevator belt. He stopped within two feet of the person to my left, then turned slightly towards me almost brushing against the person's side which was felt on the arm of my fellow participant as a light brush. The being then phased out I could no longer see him for a moment. Then suddenly I sensed the being standing directly in front of me very close and watching me intently. It felt like a presence of warm energy. I could strongly sense the energy of this being. Dove attempted to communicate in her mind with the being, pushing thoughts of benevolence and peace. He was still looking straight at me. His body then faded out leaving only the outline of his head with large round dark shiny eyes. I then asked him telepathically, who are you? As I waited for a response, his face slowly moved closer to mine until it stopped just one foot away from mine. He drew in closer still as his face phased out completely leaving only his two dark eyes at eye level with my own eyes, fixated on mine keenly and piercing me as though he was trying to read me. I would open my eyes then close them, then open them again but his eyes were still there. His eyes drew in closer still and in an intensely piercing fashion he said to me, slowly telepathically, we are of the earth, and from the earth, we are from an ancient line going back eons. Then his eyes dissolved into the night as I started feeling this strong connection like connecting the dots from this being and that mysterious gold ant that was in my tent the night before. I would see this ant-like being in my mind and then the visual would suddenly switch back to the ant then back to the being again. This repeated several times back and forth I felt a great respect for this being and the ant equally. We all sat in stillness and quietness for quite a while afterward feeling the being's continued presence surrounding us. It felt as though there was more than one insectoid like being there with us. In the years since her experience, she wondered if the being she saw was connected to the Hopi ant people. Could these ant-like insectoid beings that I met not be confused with mantis-like beings, greys or other similarly described beings, possibly be the same ant people of the legends and lore of the Hopi and other indigenous peoples? I believe that this is entirely possible and I get a strong sense that after my experience with them, this is the case. The Hopi people have described ant-like beings that were friendly, and helpful and acted as teachers. They were kind and were ultra peaceful people. The one I met certainly fit all of these characteristics. My unit and I were stationed at a training base in the Croatian National Forest. We were told that there had been sightings of this creature and it was very dangerous, so we were on guard for anything really. One night while driving with my navigator, 
I saw something very large go up in a tree about 100 to 150 yards from the road. My NCO I see also saw this and identified it as a cryptid. I didn't know what that was. I was too busy concentrating on driving in order to avoid hitting whatever it was because it happened so fast. I was convinced it was going to land right in the road, so I have no idea what kind of being it was. What we saw was a large, long, dark furred creature leapt from off a dirt road and into the middle of the road. It had been standing next to a tree just outside the wood line that runs parallel to this very desolate stretch of rural highway. It quickly leaps out of view from the road, off into the tree line, disappearing for good. At that point, I was just a young soldier at the time. It is the only cryptid sighting of my entire life. It had been a clear night with rain earlier that day, so visibility was good even into the woods that were about 20 to 50 yards from each side of this two-lane road. We stopped and got out to take a look around, but with no flashlight, we had no real idea of what direction to walk. To be honest, I was too freaked out to go into the woods for a closer look myself. We both said that whatever it was must have moved through very quickly and back off into the darkness. We did not hear anything past our own hearts racing. At this point, I've been in the army now for 23 years, and not much faces me anymore. The one thing that will always stick out in my mind was this encounter. I am a believer of UFOs, but when it comes to cryptids such as Bigfoot or whatever it was, if it leaves tracks you can find them, then I'm more than willing to believe it exists. Here's another story, I was at Fort Bragg. It was about 1 am. I was sitting on the ground outside waiting for a security checkpoint to clear when I heard something crashing through the trees just over my shoulder towards my right side. If you imagine yourself in that situation, then you have a good example of how I felt. I heard this crashing through the woods sound not more than 20 feet behind me, but there was nothing to be seen other than the trees shaking like crazy. When I turned around and looked, I saw something brown about the size of a small bear covered in fur with black hair all over its face. It kind of had a long tail and pointy ears and no hair on the very top of its face. I would say it was maybe no more than 200 pounds. I began to get very scared and started to pull out my pistol when this thing turned and saw me, ran back into the woods, and was now gone. I felt like it wasn't gonna hurt anybody and that I was safe, but if you saw this thing you would understand why I started reaching for my pistol. The whole encounter maybe lasted 5 to 10 seconds at most. The Texas highway stretched out before me a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the barren landscape. I was on my usual route, hauling a load of logs to a remote rural town. The sun was starting to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the road. It was a lonely drive, but I was used to the solitude. It was just me, my trusty old truck, and the open road. As I drove along, the rhythmic hum of the engine and the monotonous scenery started to lull me into a sense of tranquility. I was lost in my thoughts, my mind wandering to everything and nothing all at once. But that peaceful reverie was abruptly shattered when I saw something that sent a jolt of adrenaline through my veins. Up ahead, in the middle of the road, stood a group of figures. My foot instinctively eased off the gas pedal as I squinted to get a better look. At first, I thought they were a pack of wild dogs, but as I drew closer, my blood turned to ice in my veins. These creatures were like no dogs I'd ever seen. They were bipedal, standing on their hind legs like humans. Their bodies were covered in mottled, coarse fur, and their eyes glowed a sinister shade of red. Their snouts were long and black, and their mouths were filled with rows of sharp, gleaming teeth. The most unnerving thing of all was that they seemed to be communicating with each other in a language that was anything but natural. It was guttural and otherworldly, like a symphony of discordant sounds. I honked my horn, hoping to scare them away, but instead of scattering, the pack of creatures dissolved into the shadows and started to converge on my truck. Panic surged through me, and I slammed on the gas pedal, my heart racing as I tried to speed past them but they were faster than I could have ever imagined. 
One of them leapt onto the side of my truck, its claws scraping against the metal as it tried to pry open the door. Another slammed its massive body against my window, its red eyes boring into mine. They were relentless, their movements coordinated and calculated. It was as if they were working together with a single purpose, to get to me. I felt a surge of primal fear, my instincts taking over as I pushed the truck's accelerator to the floor. The engine roared to life, and the truck surged forward, tires screeching on the pavement. The creatures were still hot on my tail, their inhuman speed allowing them to keep up with my speeding truck. For what felt like an eternity, the pursuit continued. My heart hammered in my chest, and sweat poured down my brow. The howls and growls of the creatures echoed in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. But slowly, I began to gain some distance between us. The wind howled in my ears as I pushed the truck to its limits, praying that I could outrun whatever they were. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, they stopped. I risked a glance in my rearview mirror and saw the creatures standing on the road, watching me with their glowing red eyes. And then, one by one, they began to fade into the darkness, disappearing as if they were never there. Relief flooded through me, and I let out a shaky breath that I hadn't realized I'd been holding. I pulled over to the side of the road, my heart still racing, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. I sat there for a moment, trying to process what had just happened. I knew that I had encountered something beyond explanation that night. Those creatures, whatever they were, were unlike anything I had ever encountered. As I drove the rest of the way to the rural town, the image of those glowing red eyes haunted me. And even though I made it out of that ordeal alive, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had come face to face with something ancient and otherworldly, something that should have never existed in the first place. It doesn't happen while hiking but it did happen late at night and it was near an area frequented by hikers. It is still the oddest and creepiest things that happened to me despite being 15 years ago. I was 19 at the time and was driving late at night in the desert. I was going around a bend when I noticed something sitting in the middle of road. When I was still not close enough for my headlights to reflect the object, so it looked like some sort of large cat sitting in the road eating something. Except, when I finally got close enough to actually see it, it was not just a cat, it looked like some sort of cat-human hybrid, human face with cat ears, eyes that glowed when it looked into my lights, long limbs, and patches of fur are the biggest things I remember. The thing immediately ran off on all fours when it noticed me. That messed me up for a while, I had heard stories of creatures that were mutated by radiation from government experiments back in the 40s, but had never really believed them. The job of Yosemite Park Ranger isn't what most people imagine. A lot of people picture us as law enforcement types, handing out tickets and enforcing park rules, when really that's a very niche aspect of it. Mostly we're just here to assist you. Handing out maps, not speeding tickets, and giving people directions to the best views or to ideal camping locations. We remind people about safety and weather conditions from day to day. But the main thing we do, and this is more vital than people realize, is that we're just here in case anyone gets lost or hurt. We deal with a lot of belligerent people who like to think the park is their personal playground where they can do whatever they want. It's my job to remind them to follow the rules. To dispose of their trash properly, to pick up after their dog and to clip its leash back on while walking the trails. Some people take this as a personal assault on their freedoms, when really I'm just looking out for the safety of other visitors, like cyclists and horseback riders who share the paths. Dogs can be unpredictable and can misbehave on trails, and we have to look out for everyone. Still, I don't often get a lot of positive feedback for enforcing the rules. Nobody likes to be told what to do, trust me, I get it. Every once in a while something interesting happens to break up the boredom and monotony of the job. Last summer I was walking around at night, doing a patrol of the campgrounds, when I saw something rustling around in the bushes. A guy came crawling out, 
dressed in a furry dog costume. I asked him if he was okay and he just barked happily, then crawled away in the opposite direction. Shortly afterwards, I saw him chasing another person who was dressed as a cat, a woman who went scampering away and hid beneath a camper van, laughing excitedly and making purring sounds, licking the dirt from her fur pants with a long tongue. She saw me watching and clawed the air in front of her face, hissing territorially. It's not how I would choose to spend my Friday nights, but I'm not one to judge. By far the most interesting thing which has ever happened to me at Yosemite occurred last summer. And it wasn't just interesting. It was utterly terrifying. Every night when I fall asleep I have nightmares about that day. Every time I close my eyes, I picture those dark tunnels in the rock face. It all started when someone called in a report saying they were out on the Cathedral Lake Trail when their brother went missing. The pair had been out hiking when they got separated somehow. At first we thought it was just a routine mishap. People go missing in Yosemite all the time. It's no big deal in most cases, since usually the missing parties are found quickly enough. Half the time alcohol is involved and I have to remind people to pace themselves if they indulge while camping. But every once in a while those missing people don't turn up, and we have to dispatch much larger search parties. In this case I went out on my own at first, heading to where the man had called us from. I drove out on an ATV, since it was a 16 mile round trip. When I got there, the guy looked frantic. He ran over to me and started speaking way too fast to understand. I told him to slow down, and just give me the facts. It's important to stay calm in these types of situations. The guy took a deep breath and let it out. Then he started talking again, a bit slower this time. We were walking on the trail. He was right beside me. Then I turned around to look at the lake and when I looked back he was gone. Just gone. I tried to get a sense if the man had been drinking or doing drugs. It's not that I'm trying to assume the worst in people, but we have to think of these types of things. The simplest explanation is usually the right one, after all. And it was much easier to imagine the two brothers taking sips from a Mickey and one of them getting separated and lost than to imagine one of them being abducted by aliens, or taken in a very selective rapture. Slow down for a second. Take some deep breaths. What's your name, let's start with that. Greg, he said, his face turning a shade less purple as he began to inhale air with trembling breaths in and out. Okay, Greg. I took out my notepad, jotting this down, along with his last name which I'll leave out for the sake of privacy. And what's your brother's name? Dave, he said, sniffling. I saw he had been crying recently. Where was the last place you saw your brother? Let's retrace your steps. He started protesting, saying that wasn't going to help, but I convinced him we had to at least try. Greg led me back a little ways to where he'd seen his brother last. I walked back here already. And I looked all around here before calling you guys. I thought maybe he went off the trail to take a leak and tripped, hit his head. Something like that, I don't know. I was grasping at straws. But I think something. He hesitated. Something what? I probed. Do you think something took him? Like those stories you hear about? He sounded embarrassed, but I tried to get more out of him, and asked him which stories he was talking about. You know. You hear stories about Yosemite and other national parks. I'm sure you've heard about them. Even if you're not in on the conspiracy. Stories where people go missing like this, and it makes no sense. Someone turns their back for a second and their son or their sister or whoever is just gone. Disappeared, like Dave. I saw it on YouTube. Aha, I replied, not sure what corner of the internet this guy had been visiting. Well, that doesn't happen around here, I can assure you. Let's keep looking, I'm sure he'll turn up. But the longer we looked, the less we found. It really did seem like the man's brother had just vanished. I was about to call in for more support, maybe even a K-9 unit, when the man yelled from a little ways off the trail, saying he'd found something. Following the sound of his voice, I eventually came to find him at the base of the mountain, 
face to face with the granite wall. At first I didn't understand what he was doing there, but as I got closer I saw there was actually a cave which was well hidden in the rock face. It blended in perfectly with the mountainside until you were almost nose to nose with the pale grey stone. Good job, I said, patting him on the shoulder. But then I looked at our surroundings, getting nervous. We were pretty far from the path, in the thick part of the forest which was overgrown and tangled with vines and shrubbery. Do you think he would have gone into this cave on his own? Greg looked around, as if checking to see if his brother had left a message for him. But there was nothing. I don't think so. It's not like him to just leave me on the trail alone, either. Especially not for this long. If this was a prank or something he'd have come back by now. I can tell something's not right. Has your brother played pranks on you like this before? I asked. The man was in his twenties, and his brother was probably of a similar age. Young men occasionally got lost or injured trying to scare each other by pulling pranks or filming videos in the woods. It was rare but it had happened before. Once or twice, he admitted. I didn't call you guys for a while because I thought he was messing with me. I wouldn't put it past him. But not for this long. I was getting annoyed. Mosquitoes were biting my neck and I was sweating in the heat of the afternoon, after marching through the foliage for hours. I imagined the guy hiding inside the cave trying to scare his younger brother. Maybe he had fallen asleep in his dark hiding place or he was just pushing it too far, but either way, I was upset. If this was a prank, it had wasted most of my afternoon. It probably annoyed me even more because I had my own older brother who had played tricks on me more than once in our younger days, and this was bringing back memories. Alright. You can come out of there right now, I yelled, marching into the cave, thinking the young man would be hiding in the small alcove. I turned a corner and saw a dark tunnel, leading deep into the darkest recesses of the granite. This made no sense. As far as I knew, there was no tunnel in this location. Especially not one of this size. But it had been well hidden. Nearly invisible in the rock face. I wondered if anyone knew about it. And I wondered if it was safe. I didn't feel comfortable going any further. The dark space looked like it went on for a long, long way into the distance, and I was getting an eerie feeling standing there. It felt like I could almost hear voices whispering from all around me. The words were lost in the echoing cave, and I got a strong sensation that we weren't alone, like icy fingers walking slowly up my spine. The other man came in behind me, marveling at the cave for a second before continuing to press forward. Come on, Greg said, forging ahead. He might be in trouble. He was anxious to keep going. Not scared enough of this horrifying place with whispering voices coming from the shadows and his apparent lack of fear made me twice as scared. I'm going back for help, I said, shuffling backwards. It isn't safe. Nobody knows we're here. My training and my instincts were overwhelming my curiosity, but Greg seemed not to care about the dangers. The man continued going forward, disappearing into the darkness. A few seconds later he was gone, and there was no indication he had ever existed in the first place. Greg? I called out into the black abyss. There was no response. He might as well have been a ghost. An overwhelming urge to follow him rushed over me, and I took a few steps forward, feeling hypnotized by that black tunnel leading on and on forever. But then I shook my head, slapping my face as I tried to wake myself up from whatever trance I was in which was overruling my common sense. I turned around and left the cave, my legs shaking and my hands unsteady as I called for assistance. After meeting the search party back at the trail, we went through the woods again to find the cave hiding within the 10,000 foot tall rock face of Cathedral Peak. But it was gone. I remembered having trouble finding it the first time, and thinking it was well hidden among the pale grey surface of the mountainside. You had to be nearly face to face with the wall to see it since it was so invisible among the crags and boulders. I tried to tell my supervisor and the other members of the search party, but they didn't believe me. They said there was no tunnel there. They looked for hours and found nothing. 
helicopters swept the area and more teams with more dogs, bloodhounds and German shepherds. But nothing was turned up. There was no trace of anyone else having been out there, except me. Dumbfounded for the rest of the week, and for the rest of the summer, I couldn't focus on anything. My mind kept going back to that conversation I'd had with the man on the trail named Greg. The man who'd lost his brother and then disappeared into a cave that didn't exist. More and more, I began to wonder what would have happened if I'd followed him. It took a full year for me to build up the courage to go back out to that exact spot again. It happened to be on the same date, and around the same time of day. Only this time, I wasn't on duty. It was my weekend off, so I had plenty of time to comb the area for clues. My backpack was full of provisions and I had enough to last for a night or two in the woods, maybe longer if necessary. Somehow I knew. I just had a feeling that if I went back on that day at that time it would be there. The cave that didn't exist. Cathedral Peak loomed above me, getting larger as I made my way through the forest, moving toward it. The grey clouds above were shrouding the sun in darkness, while the thickening canopy blocked any remaining light from overhead. A chill ran through me, causing me to shiver involuntarily as I laid eyes on the black hole in the rock face, so plain and clear to see now. Taking a step forward, I found myself standing right in front of it, and I reached up my hands to feel the outline of the entryway, as if to confirm it was real. It was. I took a deep breath, like a diver about to submerge, and went inside. The air was cold and damp, with a strange, coppery smell. My flashlight was on my belt and I grabbed it, but then decided not to turn it on. I was getting a strange feeling, like I was in an unsafe place, and needed to stay silent and hidden. There was a sound coming from up ahead which I couldn't place. It was a slurping, chewing sound. Like someone tearing meat from bones with their teeth. As I went deeper and deeper into the tunnel, the air became colder, and so damp that I felt droplets of water running down my face and into my eyes. A trickle of light was filtering in somewhere as well, causing the cavern to faintly glow in places. The air seemed to shimmer and dance in front of my eyes as I went deeper and deeper, feeling entranced as I stumbled along in the shadows. Faintly I realized that there was something wrong with me, as if I had been drugged, but I no longer cared. In fact, I found the sensation to be quite pleasant. And then I was abruptly awoken from my daydream as I came around a corner and saw the horror unfolding within the guts of Cathedral Peak. I can't possibly explain what I saw down there. And the shadows obscured most of it, drenching the monstrous creature in darkness. But the impression I got was of something like an octopus or a squid, crossbred with an oversized plant or a fungus, sucking and slurping, chewing and crunching something between its teeth. After a few moments of inspection, I realized it was a person's face that was being eaten, as the details could just barely be seen in the dim light of the cave. The skin was being stripped from its cheeks, the eyelids ripped off, and the lips peeled back and slurped up like noodles. Tentacles like tangled vines were everywhere, slithering and sliding across the pale grey stone floor all around me. At first I thought it was mud beneath my feet, but as I came fully to my senses I realized it was blood mingling and mixing with the dust beneath my feet, creating a dark, toxic red slurry which sucked at my boot heels. The tentacle vine things were everywhere, I realized with numb shock. My feet were actually stepping on some of them and I was amazed the creature hadn't noticed me yet. But it was obviously too caught up with whatever meal it was currently ingesting. Feeling very glad I hadn't turned on my flashlight, I began to back away very slowly, my boots crunching across the writhing tentacles. A sick knot in my stomach was rising up and threatening to make me puke, fear and revulsion twisting my gut. My mind was spinning and my thoughts were racing understanding there was a very good chance I would never leave this place. I tried desperately not to step on any more of the squirming, writhing tentacles which moved and twisted on the floor of the cave, soaking and basking in the blood which had been spilled everywhere, like pigs rolling happily in the mud. There was no possible way there could be so much of it, I thought. No one person has this much blood. 
This is like a river. And then I saw the others. They were hanging suspended from the ceiling, from the walls, from everywhere. Amidst the purple, vine tentacles, they breathed in and out, still being kept alive, but just barely. Dozens of them were strung up and down the length of the cave, their chests rising and falling with weak breaths, but none of them opening their eyes or speaking. It was like they were sleeping. After a few long moments of searching, I found him. Greg. The hiker from the trail who was looking for his brother. He was hanging upside down from the wall just beside me, his eyes closed. Parts of him were missing, a piece of his cheek, part of his hand, but the wounds were slowly healing. The creature, whatever it was, kept its victims alive down there, I realized. It was ingesting them slowly, perhaps even using pieces of its other victims as nutrients to feed the ones who were dying of starvation, like another worldly pyramid scheme built of blood and human remains. Shaking that mental image away, I grabbed Greg's shoulder, hoping to wake him up quietly. His eyes shot open a second after I touched him, revealing only the whites, and he began to screech. And I don't mean screeching like he was screaming out of fear of pain or anything like that. This was an inhuman alarm cry which signified to me immediately that there was no shred of humanity left in him. He was now a part of the hive mind of the creature and its tentacle army. As his head turned on a swivel I saw smaller tentacles were wrapped around him, going into his brain and into his neck, invading his ears and eyes, and drilled into his spinal column. I screamed involuntarily, seeing these details, and heard the creature in the tunnel as it recognized my presence. It wasn't fast, whatever it was, but it was huge. The cave shook around me, dust and pebbles falling from the stone ceiling above as I backed away from the hiker. Beneath my feet the vines were suddenly moving quickly, sliding around so that I couldn't find my balance. As soon as my shoes found purchase on the stone floor beneath me, I began to run. The tunnel was alive all around me now, the whipping vines twisting and bending toward me, reaching out like greedy hands trying to grab me as I raced past. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the amorphous creature's central girth was finding its way through the cave and was moving my way a lot faster than I would have thought possible. But then again, I wouldn't have thought any of this was possible before living it. The light of the entryway was just up ahead, and I could smell the fresh air, and could see the sun. Then my feet suddenly slipped as if someone had pulled a rug out from under me and I went crashing to the ground face first. My jaw closed hard and bit the end of my tongue causing it to bleed, the taste of copper filling my mouth a second later. I tried to get to my feet, the mental image of those poor, trapped people could be seen clearly in my mind's eye. In retrospect, I think the creature, whatever it was, needed us to be unsuspecting. If we were aware of what it was doing, its hypnosis wouldn't work. Maybe it was a chemical it released which caused people to want to explore the cave, a pheromone-like insects used to communicate. But it didn't work as well if you knew about it, and if you understood its purpose. It released some more of that pheromone or whatever chemical it was using to lure people in, and I actually felt my legs grow a bit heavier. My eyelids, too. It was like I had suddenly just worked three night shifts, and really needed to sleep. But then the wave of hypnosis passed and I felt the rumbling of the ground beneath me and that broke me from the trance again, causing me to scramble to my feet from the cave floor and run. As I neared the cave entrance and sprinted toward it, leaving my backpack far behind in an effort to lighten the load, I saw the rocks were actually closing in, tightening the gap. The entryway was shrinking somehow. It was the vines, I realized. They were what was camouflaging the entrance their color changing to match the pale gray stone. I picked up my pace, the twisting forms beneath me making it even more difficult. I didn't dare risk a glance over my shoulder, feeling the rumbling of the floor and knowing that the bulk of the creature was just behind me, closing in. With the gap of the exit narrowing even further, shrinking to the size of a dartboard, I dove headfirst into it. Imagining my face slamming into a sheer rock wall as it suddenly turned to stone right in front of me, sealing me in this dark labyrinth of suffering forever with the rest of these tortured souls. 
My eyes were squinted tightly shut as I felt the vines pulling and tearing at me as I went through the gap. For an instant they squeezed in around my midsection, threatening to stop me like Winnie the Pooh after an unfortunate attempt at pilfering honey, when I popped out of the hole and it sealed up behind me in an instant. I heard a loud crash as the creature flew headlong into its own obstruction. The trap it had created for me to keep me there had hindered its escape, preventing it from chasing after me. I could hear it thrashing and clawing at the vines, desperate for more flesh to sustain itself. Whatever it was, it was growing too large even for its own control. Left alone to feed in the heart of the mountain, it would eventually destroy itself. It would consume its own flesh to sate its monstrous hunger, like a snake eating its own tail. I had a very strong suspicion that it was true. With that very specific idea in mind, I wandered back to my car. It was easier now without the backpack and all the gear. But the walk back to the cave would be harder. There would be lots to carry next time. After a trip to the hardware store, I went back out to the trail. It was nighttime now, and the place was abandoned. I borrowed one of the Ranger AT Versus and took my supplies out to the spot where the cave had been. After bringing a few buckets of water from the lake, I began my work. Since I had marked the cave, it was easy to find it again, and to begin laying down the fast drying cement. As park rangers, our job is usually to stop people from vandalizing mountains in this way, but I got the feeling mother nature would forgive me. It was my job to protect this place, and the people who visited. And nothing could protect people from this thing. It was best to seal it away forever, and let it slowly consume itself. Without a fresh supply of hikers, it would eventually run out of calories. It would eventually expire. It was only a matter of time. The vine tentacles squirmed beneath the layer of cement, groggily reaching out for me, trying to pull me in. I grabbed the trowel and slopped on another thick coating and watched as it rapidly began to dry. And the tentacles began to smooth out and settle down again, falling back asleep. That inhuman shriek could be heard from inside again, much louder this time. As if all of the hikers who the creature had abducted had all woken up at the same instant, and for just a second, realized their predicament. Sorry, Greg, I muttered to myself, alone in the dark forest. I told you not to go in there. I ran into Bigfoot on the beach. I'd been a beach bum for a bit, haunting the shores of a coastal town. It wasn't a bad gig. I'd figured out how to live pretty comfortably and I was making more than I ever had in the string of dead-end jobs I'd been able to keep. Alcoholism is a harsh mistress but I figured out that if I stayed under the police radar and stayed out of the dope game people left me alone. I sold glass and macrame jewelry. Sitting on the beach in a wife beater and BDU cargo pants for most of that summer. I made the arrowheads from the bottoms of bottles, the little eccentrics were from broken arrowheads. Gauge the tourist, size them up and charge whatever I could. Once in a while a nice tourist girl would pick me up and I'd spend a night in a hotel. I mostly stayed by myself, I built a little lean-to out of driftwood and the California sun was warm enough I didn't really need a sleeping bag or anything. Wake up at 2 a.m., take three shots, wake up at 6 a.m., take three shots, then grab my blanket and wander back to where I was selling stuff. I'd drink sporadically during the day, then I'd retreat back to my little hideaway and get shit-hammered. I was wandering back to my hideaway one night. My hair was braided up and I had a cigarette in one hand and a bottle of bourbon in the other. The bag thrown casually over my shoulder had a couple of perch and some urchins in it. My money was mostly for booze after all. The thing wandered out of the ocean and looked at me. I looked back. It stood about 7 feet tall, its eyes were bulbous and it had a very obvious fishy flair to it. I put the cigarette in my mouth and reached down to the knife on my belt. I'm not much of a boxer or a wrestler, but I could scrap and I don't spook easily. We made baleful eye contact for a bit and then it turned around and walked back into the waves. I kept walking, unsnapping the sheath on my knife but otherwise a bit unfazed. Find a fatalistic, 
homeless alcoholic and I'll show you someone who really doesn't give a damn. I started the fire back at my little lean-to and cracked the urchin with a couple of spoons. I should have stolen some lemon too, but urchin aren't bad eating anyways. I tossed the shells into the waves while I gutted the perch and cooked them. I proceeded to kill the bottle of bourbon and retrieve the cheap handle of vodka from inside the lean-to. No one really bothered me, I'd had some trouble with a group of tweakers when I first got down here. Got my ass kicked pretty good, but I'd also managed to put two of the group in the hospital before I limped away. I was a hard target, I really had nothing, I wasn't in their game, and I left them alone as long as they didn't bother me. The one who'd gotten the worst of it had lost an eye during the brawl. The cops never questioned me about it, truth was that no one gave a shit. I'd sometimes turn and find him watching me and I'd always give him the finger and keep going. He knew better than to screw with my camp. I'd chuck the bits of perch I didn't eat into the waves. Just letting them roll out with the tide, I was pretty sure I saw a scaled hand grab at the spine of one but I decided I was just drunk. Now, there's something a lot of people don't talk about. The missing women get a lot of attention but the missing men don't. And trust me, a lot of us disappear out there. Sometimes we just skip town without telling anyone. Sometimes a fight gets lethal and there's no one to look. That doesn't account for all of them though, and I'd seen a number in my time. I'd heard that there were a lot of them out here, but it never bothered me. It was a tourist town, after all, and a lot of people would just move on. I was less scared than you'd think by the giant fishy thing. You spend enough time on the road and in the woods and sooner or later you realize that there are some weird little cracks in the world. Don't act like you're in a horror movie and glimpses are mostly what you get. The quiet places of the earth don't abide by the same rules, the gods of the roads rule the long expanses between towns and mother nature is one hell of a weird bitch. I'd develop some superstitions. Black dogs mostly. That's another story. Like I said, don't get too close. Don't investigate. Leave the weird to itself and it leaves you to yourself. That's life out here. A lot of home bums don't get it, but travelers? We see a lot and there's really no talking about it with normal people since. Let's face it, most of us have some pretty serious issues with addiction and mental illness. I went to sleep on my blanket and woke up at 2 a.m. like usual. Physical addiction to alcohol doesn't abide by what hours you want to sleep, you just deal with it. I took a shaky shot and watched the quiet waves lap up the shore then took another two back to back and lit a cigarette. It wasn't the best life, but it was a good one. You'd be surprised at how many of the downfalls of alcoholism come from other people. The thing emerged again, walking alongside my campsite and looking at the glowing embers of the fire. I tossed a piece of driftwood on, watching it flare up so I could get a better look at it. Curiosity got the better of me. Again. I regretted the decision almost immediately. It was scaled from head to toe, clawed as well. It had big teeth. Its eyes were the worst part, bulbous and fish-like with a hint of cunning. I took the bottle of vodka to my mouth and two long swallows. You may as well sit down, I said motioning to a thick trunk I dragged near the fire, if you're looking to scare me, you did it already. It looked at me and I repeated the gesture. The fish Bigfoot thing sat down across the fire from me. I turned around and grabbed my rucksack, figuring I'd break bread with it. I found the jerky and offered it a piece. It reached out and took it and threw it in its mouth. Might want to chew that, big boy, I said as it made some sputtering noises. I gestured at my mouth and mime chewing, it reached into its enormous maw and pulled the chunk of jerky forward and tried its best to chew. The pointed teeth shredded and tore at it for a while, guess you don't really have the right equipment for it. I took another long pull on the bottle. It gestured at the bottle and I looked at it through the side of my eye. Why the hell not? Careful with that, I said, making a gesture for a small amount with my right hand, poquito, you know? I handed the bottle over and Fish Bigfoot took a short amount of it. It looked at me like I'd betrayed it and handed the bottle back. It ain't for everyone, I told it flatly, this is a professional drink, 
I chuckled and it mimicked me until we were both outright laughing. It sounded more like a frog than anything, but it was decent company. I was a couple of miles out of town and it was pretty rare that anyone came out to my camp other than the sheriff who checked up on me once in a while. I sat there, just kind of having a one-sided conversation with it until the sun came up. As soon as the first rays of the sun started showing it stood up, I waved at it and it waved back. It walked back into the tide. Things went like that for a few nights. One-sided, drunk conversations with fish Bigfoot. It seemed to like me. At least enough it brought me a thresher shark, although it seemed a bit offended when I cooked my portion. My days got a bit dark though. My life? It wasn't bad. I was free to be me, which mostly meant drunk and alone. That's not how it goes for everyone out there. Old one I had been stalking me for a while but was gone all of a sudden. I met a teenage runaway. I tried to convince her to go home, but whatever she was running from was worse than life out here. At the very least, I told her, stay away from the dope. Pretty soon she was running around with the tweakers who kept camp closer to town. She'd come and talk to me during the day and I watched the pretty little thing lose weight and start acting oddly. I knew this game. I was a drunk. Not a hero. Just a scrappy loner, albeit I was apparently some kind of fish Bigfoot whisperer playing hero. Well it goes badly. I'd done it a few times, and right now I just kind of absorbed the sad and watched. I'd been chilling with Fish Bigfoot, whom I was now calling Henry, for three weeks. The weird was lessening quite a bit, we'd managed some rudimentary two-way communication. He liked fish, bugged me for jerky, and after some amount of experimentation it turns out Henry was a big fan of tequila. I had enough spare cash that it wasn't a big deal, but he drank like, well, a 7 foot tall, 300 pound fish Bigfoot. He even brought a friend a couple of times. Henry was pretty damn big for his race as far as I could tell, he towered over most of the other ones he brought. So one night when I heard stirring by the fire I sat up and saw Henry standing there with a serious look on his face. Bared teeth, the fin on his head raised. For a split second I thought he was going to eat me. He didn't, he motioned for me to follow him. When I got up he looked at me doubtfully and then pointed at my knife. I took the hint and strapped it onto my belt, stopping long enough to grab my bourbon and smokes as well. I offered him the tequila bottle but he waved it away. He began moving down the beach and I followed him. We'd made it about a half mile when I heard the screams. I quickened my pace to a solid run, chucking the cigarette to the side. Ahead of me Henry began moving quickly, he stopped suddenly when we were near the sources and motioned at himself in the trees. I didn't like the scene I came upon. One I had a knife in his hand, standing above the runaway that had been talking to me. The others stood around, all shirtless and painted with various symbols. I don't play hero, I told myself softly. I took a long swig of the bourbon and pulled the knife. I don't play hero. I charged in without really spending a whole lot more time thinking about it. Not a hero, just doing what needed to be done. The girl had been cut up already. I ran directly into one eye before he could plunge the knife. You mother f, he said to me as we bowled over. I slashed at him with the big combat knife, laying open his cheek underneath the dead eye. Someone grabbed me from behind and I felt a knife slice at my left arm. I tore free and spun, slashing at the other one. They circled me and I stood over the girl, watching the sides and turning in a slow circle. A half dozen of them close. Another four hanging back. For the first time since I'd left the woods all those years ago I really wished I'd had a gone. The first one leapt towards me and I swept to the side and stuck forward with the knife. He missed me, and a moment afterwards I realized he'd been aiming for the bound girl. The hilt hit his stomach. Cutting people up is a grisly business, a slash here and there is one thing but sticking it in their guts? You can smell it. There were two dead aggressors in my past. As I pulled the knife free with a twist I assumed it was now three. I figured I could handle two more before I got cut. Or I could let them have the girl and run. I'm no hero I told myself. 
I caught a blow aimed at the girl with my left forearm, feeling the knife dig deep. I snapped in a way I hadn't since I'd been in the woods that weren't woods all those years ago. I tore into them, catching blows aimed at the girl. Blood mixed, I wasn't sure whose was whose within seconds. I knew I was getting fainter and weaker by the second. A blow came for the girl, struck her stomach and she screamed and twisted against her binds. I fell to my knees, sure I was going to be dead soon. Henry suddenly came running into the circle. It worked. When I screamed. I took the opportunity to use the last of my strength, reaching for him with my knife. I struck home, dragging it outward and to the right. Henry tore into the tweakers. Fish Bigfoot was on my side. What I'd been doing was gruesome, his attacks were overkill. He ripped off limbs with ease and bit off heads. For my part I hammered on one eye with the butt of my knife until he was an unrecognizable mess. Two more of them came out of the waves. They began dragging the bodies back into the sea as I sat there, exhausted. Henry moved toward the girl after all of the bodies were gone and I tried to stand and get myself in the way. He held me up then bent down to untie the girl. For my part, I finally collapsed. When I woke up, Henry was gone and the cops were there. I left town two days later, richer for my experience with fish Bigfoot Henry. I'll always say it's not time to be curious when the weird shows up, but I think my life is richer for the time I spent with Henry. I'm in the desert now, but someday I want to go back and see if he'll drink some tequila with me and we can enjoy the beach like the good old days. It's time for a light supernatural story. Not so much of a hiking though, it was a survival test for joining a mountaineering club in my campus. There were 20-ish of us including myself, in the middle of the woods, with our foods were confiscated by the recruitment commit so that we needed to find natural foods from nature such as fruit, especially banana, edible plants, or even locust or snake if lucky. Miserable test, but valuable experience indeed. One day, it was raining so hard in the afternoon and all of our five groups hadn't finished set up our group bivouacs. We intentionally set them near each other so we could check everyone instantly something is going wrong. No one was talking or chatting to each other, it was only given by our soaked clothes and empty stomachs, when suddenly all of us heard a hysterical woman scream. And five seconds surprised woman scream. Everyone heard it and the scream was so close and loud, we all thought it was one of us screaming because of snake or something. So naturally, the boys jolted instantly to a bivouac we thought was the source of the scream. No girls were crouching or standing up as we imagined. All of us stared at each other, especially the girls as we thought one of them was pulling a prank on us to surprise us. No one claimed the scream nor admitted that it was her joke, everyone looked equally shocked. After minutes of investigating the girls, we then went back to our respective groups with an unanswered incident, even after the recruitment process was finished and we went back to civilization. After we officially members of the club, we shared that story to our seniors and it turns out, the place my batch used to set bivouacs was the first time to be used in five years. And the last batch used that part of the woods experienced the exact screaming incident, also without any logical explanation, and they chose to base that incident as their batch name Forest Cry. I'm genuinely concerned for my mental well-being after a recent unsettling incident in my home. I've considered sharing my experience in a post, both here and on our mental health. However, I'm hesitant about the latter as I fear some might rush to diagnose me with conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Up until now, I haven't displayed any signs of mental instability or depression, apart from a brief period of sadness about external issues that occurred several years ago and left no lasting effects. I'm currently in my 20s, attending university, and the past few years have generally been quite positive, with some good news regarding my career and relationship. I apologize for the lengthy introduction, but I wanted to provide context and convey the shock I'm currently experiencing. I recently witnessed unexplainable activity, 
And since the only response I've received from those close to me is you're crazy, I'm seeking others who may have had similar experiences or insights. Here's what happened, it was around 11 p.m., and I had just returned home from a choir session. While I wasn't particularly tired, I was eager to relax in bed and catch up on a Netflix series I had been looking forward to. I hurriedly made my way home without paying much attention to my surroundings. It wasn't until I stood in front of my door that I realized it was wide open. I live in an area where it's customary to leave doors open until late at night or until every family member is home. It's a close-knit village where everyone knows each other, and each home is enclosed by fences with a garden, making it easy to spot any potential intruders from a window. Returning to the story, I reached inside the entrance to trigger the light sensor and adjust the triangular device, I'm not sure of the English term for it, that my family uses to prop the door open. However, the entrance and the stairs leading to the apartments remained in darkness. Despite my eyes being accustomed to the darkness, I noticed that the door to my family's apartment was also wide open at the end of the few steps in front of me. This situation unnerved me, but what happened next was even more unsettling. I suddenly felt extremely dizzy, as if I were intoxicated, and I stumbled backward outside, losing my balance on the doorstep. That's when I saw it, a figure emerging from my apartment, standing before me for a few moments, and then ascending another set of stairs. The figure had long hair, but I couldn't discern any other details due to its black silhouette. Its movements were peculiar, as if its legs weren't moving normally but instead sliding up the steps. My stomach churned with fear. I became convinced that there were intruders in my house, and I grew increasingly worried for my brother, who lived in the apartment above mine and was at home that night. I was afraid that the intruders might catch him off guard. In a state of panic, I backed away from the house and rushed to the gate, frantically ringing my brother's doorbell. He answered shortly after, asking if I had forgotten my keys. I hesitated for a few seconds, unsure of what to say. Finally, I asked if our parents were home. They were not. I inquired if he had friends over. He replied in the negative. I cautiously returned to the entrance and listened for any sounds, but there was nothing. A few minutes later, my cat approached me, seeking attention, and then entered the house. Strangely, the lights on the stairs immediately came on. I stood in my garden for a while, feeling bewildered, frightened, and on the verge of fainting. I was sweating profusely. Summoning my courage, I entered the house, clutching my keys as a makeshift defense. I reached my brother's floor without encountering anyone or anything unusual. I peeked inside and, upon seeing my brother's family on the couch, simply bid them good night. I rushed down to my own apartment, locked the door, and meticulously checked every room. That night, I cried intensely because, for a brief moment, I genuinely believed there was an intruder. I was scared and confused. I still have no idea what actually transpired, and each attempt to rationalize it leaves me even more perplexed. I hope to receive feedback and am willing to answer questions, as long as they're not too personal. I kindly request that only serious comments be shared, as I'm genuinely concerned. Thank you. It was a few years ago but I was camping near a beach with some friends for a couple days and one night, God knows what I was thinking, I decided to go for a walk by myself well after 12 in the middle of January. While I was hiking through the woods, toward the beach, I kept hearing some sort of humming, strumming sound but didn't think much of it so I pressed on. As I kept going deer were running my direction and I guess didn't see me or didn't care because they kept getting real close and started to freak me out, but I stupidly kept going. Eventually the humming sound got louder and I started to see what I assumed was a lantern and figured it was some other camper so I tried to quiet myself as much as I could and go around their clearing. As I got closer I learned that I was so. Wrong. The lantern I saw was a bonfire roughly the size of a car and the humming was about 20 to 30 half-naked old people rubbing some kind of powder on their chests and foreheads. They were all dancing? Around the fire and humming, 
chanting while one of them just strummed the same three chords on a broken looking guitar. Needless to say I was spooked to all hell so I started to backpedal as slowly and quietly as I could. When one of them, an older guy with some feathery necklace, looks right at me, waves, and says, oh hey there young fella, why don't you come join us and warm up a bit? I'm sure you're cold with just that jacket. Let the flames and ash show you the warmth nature has provided for us tonight. I ran my ass as fast as I could through the woods and I made sure to take as many detours as I could before going back to camp because I swear I heard them following me. I know they called out after me while I was running. The second I got back I pulled out our hatchet and woke up the other guys just in case. They didn't believe me at first but eventually they did and none have slept the rest of the night. We did end up seeing them the next day and I can add that story if people request it but anyway, thanks for reading. Part 2, since my odd late night adventure got me, and everyone else, pretty spooked we decided to move our campsite further away from the clearing where I saw all the weird shit and closer to one of the rocky outcoves by the beach. It must have been around 5 or so because we could start to see the sunrise so we figured that would be the best time to pack up and move. Traveling to the water was fine. We didn't hear anything but we did come across some ash piles close to where we were camping and used them to direct ourselves the opposite direction. Eventually we made our way to the cove and set up camp around some boulders and a washed up canoe. While we setting up we heard some twigs snapping and hoped it was just deer making their way through the woods. But of course it wasn't, the sound was too consistent to be more than a couple deer. It was the old people. I immediately hid down behind the boulders and peeked through the brush while most of my friends did the same or hid under the canoe. I watched the old people as closely as I could without getting spotted this time, and didn't see anything too interesting other than some kind of ceremony they held. Now I don't know what religion it was but they all stood in a line in front of the older guy from the last post. The older guy had a picture frame next to him with, what I assume was, Another older person in the photo, couldn't tell 100% from where I was. The older guy was holding a bowl of ashes and each person in line held either a flower, feather, or large leaf. Each person would take turns going up to the older guy with their object. The older guy would then take it, dip it in the ashes, rub it on their faces, mouths, chests, and hands before giving it back to them. After each person received their object, they would walk a few feet and stand in the sunlight motionless until every other person had done the same. None of them would sit, none of them would move. They just stood there. Eventually when the older guy did the same to himself he stood in front of them, with his back turned to them, and slowly lifted his arms like the Dark Souls guy. Each of the other old people did the same and after a couple minutes, each person proceeded to put their blessed object in their mouth or hair but most preferred the prior. My friends and I must have spent an hour or two watching them do this until they all started walking back into the woods silently. We still don't know what they were doing but we like to look back and laugh on how weird it was. Didn't actually see anything, and I'm really glad I didn't. A friend and I had started walking a trail system that leads deep through some woods and fields by his house around dusk. During the day it's really peaceful and green and whatnot, but it was late and it was getting dark fast. The area we live in has been flooding recently and the trail is currently two feet underwater about halfway through the loop, but my friend said we could walk to that point and then take a shortcut back to the beginning through one of those man-made pine forests where the trees are all perfectly lined and spaced apart. We only had to go about 50 feet into the pines before the canopy made it pitch black all around us, but he knows the area so we kept going. About a hundred feet further and we both hear a very distinctive squeaky door noise. Like, literally no chance of it being anything other than old rusty hinges. He's come through here 20 times in the past few weeks while jogging during the day and confirms that he's never seen any type of building or anything with a door back here. We both decided that we'd rather just walk the trail back the way we came in than deal with whatever horror movie shit was happening in there. I've never noped out of a situation faster than I did then.
so moved into a brand new house. Land was an old farm, and since we have moved in we have had odd things happen. First thing I've noticed it's some items being moved, like put the remote down on the table and come back to it. And it's moved to the middle on the baby monitor we see orbs at night that just disappear in front of the camera. I walked past the door and saw something stood in the hallway so walked back only to see the dog staring into the hallway. As if she's looking at someone. My Alexa speaker responding to someone asking it for music. This has happened several times. However today I was on my own in the lounge, the device was in the kitchen. Baby is asleep nobody else in the house, the Alexa sparked to life and said playing something stupid by Robbie Williams on Amazon Music. Now I freaked out like how's this switched on? I've checked with my partner and she's not done it remotely. And if she did it would have gone straight to play musics and not said now playing. I've checked my ring camera and nothing has triggered. I've then checked the Alexa voice recorder and you can hear a very faint almost distant voice saying the song. I don't recognize the voice. The other thing to note is my phone battery went from 81% moment before this happened to 21% after this happened. What do you guys think? Approximately three times a month, with occasional fluctuations, I experience a pronounced energy presence in my room. This sensation often triggers my cat to vocalize and act as though it's observing an unseen entity, although this behavior typically subsides shortly afterward. These occurrences have repeated multiple times. Furthermore, during nighttime, I frequently encounter a peculiar sensation of a small hand touching my waist. I also perceive the feeling of someone walking on my bed, accompanied by a distinct sense of pressure on the mattress and a heightened energy ambience in the room. I'm left wondering about the nature of these experiences, could they be indicative of a benevolent spirit, a malevolent entity, or even the possibility of extraterrestrial involvement? Basically I'm doing what a normal person would do around this time I'm asleep and well suddenly I'm woken up by two loud knocks that sound human on my window please note that my window looks out onto an enclosed and locked in back patio therefore nothing should be able to access it but anyways here I am I'm startled AF and too freaked out to look eventually after about 3 minutes I decide to go look as I need to plug back in my stuff as this was right after a thunderstorm and well when I look out there's absolutely nothing there no signs of anything at all and well in the morning I went to the other side of my window to find absolutely nothing no back door unlocked no signs of activity absolutely nothing and well after this I decided to pull out my phone and type this out in an attempt to debunk this, really sorry if this was confusing. About a year ago, my significant other and I decided to go camping after she told me she'd never been before. Well this former boy scout found a spot, packed his pack, and decided to give her the camping trip of a lifetime. We got to the site, left the envelope with cash for the overnight fee at the empty cabin, and drove into the woods. There were sites all along the paths, but some were taken. Seeing as she wanted to be as removed as possible, we decided to turn left and go up a steep incline to see if there were sites at the top. Well, what I saw will haunt me till the day I die. Not more than 10 feet in front of the car, after I slam the brakes, is a giant black bear, on its hind legs and looking straight at us. No one blinks. After a minute, he gets down in a huff, turns around, and scampers off. A few minutes after that, my significant other and I break out in screams of terror and floor it back to the edge of the campsite. Fast forward to that night. We'd settled down a bit from our encounter, and prepared to go to sleep. We'd chosen a site right next to a stream, so as to have it lull us to sleep. Big mistake. We're both cuddling and falling asleep, when suddenly, we hear a splash in the stream. We both bolt upright, both thinking of the same animal that we are now realizing might be thirsty and nearby. Our car is parked just 20 feet from the tent and we consider making a sprint for it before hear another few splashes in the water, followed by a grunt. Well, if the splashing didn't do it, 
The noise did. Eager to make a ruckus, I sound the alarms on my car and scream F you as loud as I can. We then nope the F out of the tent, dive into the car, and drive off, leaving everything behind. We drove around for about 10 minutes of terror after that, plotting next moves and discussing our certainty of having just avoided death. Eventually, we decide to return to the campsite, throw everything into the trunk as fast as humanly as possible, and yeet it to the open road. We then went back to my house, reset up the tent in our fenced-in backyard right behind the porch, and went to sleep. late to the party, so this will probably get buried, but. Many years ago, a friend stopped by from out of town and brought a hefty dose of LSD with them. Beautiful summer night, so we drop a few tabs and decide to go for a hike. A half mile from my house is a river with a trail leading through the woods to a cemetery. In high school there were always stories of Satan worshippers using this cemetery and tales of a witch's grave. There are also creepy-ass cairns, spaced out in the woods behind the cemetery. I've walked through the place many times and never seen anything suspicious, just a peaceful place to spend some time. I found the supposed witch's grave, though. Just another grave to me. Anyway, heads full of acid, we're heading up the narrow path leading to the cemetery in the dark when out of nowhere like eight hooded figures walk past us in the opposite direction. We never heard them coming, one second they're there, the next they're gone. They don't look at us or say anything, just walk past with their heads down. My buddy and I give each other the old what the f? Look, shrug and continue on. We make our way through the woods into the cemetery. Start to peek. It's fully dark now, and we're walking down one of the side paths trying to find the witch's grave which is proving difficult considering the trip and the darkness. Suddenly, a hundred feet or so ahead of us, multiple lights spring into being, maybe a dozen of them, and just hover. We stop immediately and look at each other, confirm that we're both seeing this and it's not just a hallucination. And then, as we're watching, freak the F out, they very abruptly scatter in all directions, disappearing into the cemetery. Time to go. We do an about face and start double timing it toward my place, keeping our heads on a swivel. For the first couple minutes Terry's nothing. Then, randomly off in the woods we'd see a single light flash on, only to disappear seconds later. Then a few more. Sounds of running and heavy breathing are coming from the woods. They're all around us. We're walking faster and faster, no longer giving a f about what's happening, just wanting to get away. I'm trying to think through the acid, but all I can come up with is that the Satan worshippers have summoned the alien overlords, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be sacrificed to them at any moment. We turn down the final path out of the cemetery, I can see the gates and the street beyond, and I start thinking we might actually make it out. Then a dark hooded figure steps out from behind a mausoleum to our left, and a brilliant light blinds us. It's a man. In a solemn, deadly calm voice he says, you're it. We're frozen. No idea how to proceed. Finally my buddy stutters. What? You're not with us, are you? The man replies. Ah, uh, no man, we're not with you. He lowers his hood. It's a kid. Like a teenager, but still, just a kid. Turns out he's playing flashlight tag with his buddies. He apologizes in his manly voice for bothering us, turns off his light, and runs back into the cemetery to rejoin his friends. So yeah, that was a fun night. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.